on the back table. Uh, if you want to testify tonight on the Oak Ridge Meadows land use matter, I would encourage you to go uh, back and fill one of these out so that we make sure that we've got your name and address to contact you. Uh, and we know uh, to call you up during the public hearing. So there are a number of these on the back table. When you have them filled out, please give them to Melissa Bissett, our city recorder, and she'll be the collector of those and make sure that they get up to the dais for the mayor to call your name during that hearing. Thank you. Well, we welcome everyone this evening to the uh, July 23rd, 2019 um, City Council meeting and I'll call us to order. Um, I will ask uh, Council President Mankey to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, if she would. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Kelly. As with all city council, uh, tonight is being recorded, and so I would ask you to please mute your phones or put them on airplane mode uh, to not interrupt uh, the proceedings this evening uh, if your phone rings. Um, this evening, uh, the first item on our agenda is a um, public hearing. And if I may, um, um, this we're going to have one quasi-judicial public hearing to consider three land use applications for the Oak Ridge Meadows project. These land use decisions are represented by ordinances number 5065, 5069, and 5070. At our meeting, our last uh, city council meeting on the 25th of June, uh, the city council conducted its first reading of each ordinance and directed staff to schedule a time for public hearing. And that's where we are this evening. Uh, I want to thank everyone who's come to the public hearing uh, and for your participation. Oregon Land Use goal, their number one goal is citizen participation. The intent that that goal is to provide an opportunity for citizens to participate in la land use decisions and its process. However, land use decisions are a legal decision, a discussion impacting real property and the city of McMinnville and the McMinnville City Council are held to regulus statutory and local, reg local regulations about how to make land use decisions. So the decision and the process are transparent and fair to all. The city council must take their decision and make their decision based on the federal, state, and local regulatory governing the project at the time that it was submitted. All decisions must have legal findings based on whether or not land use application meets the criteria of the state of Oregon laws and the McMinnville City Code. If applications do not meet the provisions of the comprehensive plan or the McMinnville City Code as presented, but could meet it with a conditional of approval, then the City Council must provide that condition of approval as an opportunity to meet the requirements of the code. Oh. 
All testimony in the hearing must be directed towards the criteria listed on the staff report or other criteria in the comprehensive plan or other land use uh, regula regulations that the person's testifying believes up to apply to the decision. A failure to raise an issue accompanied by the statements or evidence uh, sufficient to afford the city council and the parties an e uh, uh, the parties an opportunity to respond to the re issue preclude, precludes uh, pr uh, appeal to the Lo uh, Land Use Board of Appeals based on those issues. Failure for the applicant to rise constitutional or other issues relating to proposed conditions of approval with sufficient a specific a specificity to allow the city council to respond to the issues precludes a, uh, precludes an action for damages in uh, in circuit court. The order uh, of procedure for tonight's hearings are going to be set out on the board, and we have information that will be presented. In brief, we will start with a staff report. Um, and that staff report, uh, we received a large staff report last week in our first reading, and we've asked uh, staff to come back and briefly introduce uh, the salient points to us this evening. Uh, next, the applicant will be asked to present his or her case. Everyone who su uh, supports the application will be given an opportunity to speak after the applicant is finished. Okay, now we're going to be giving this evening uh, the applicant uh, 20 minutes to testify before the council. Uh, we will then, those who would like to testify on behalf of the applicant, will have three minutes to address their comments to the council. Those. Um, then questions from the counselors may be posed uh, to the mayor and to be addressed to the applicant or the, the supporters. Again, that will run through me. Uh, anytime counselors ask a question and a question is being answered, we will stop the three minute clock or the 20 minute clock. So questions that are asked are not going to take away from your three minutes of testimony. Um, We will then have an opportunity uh, for the applicant to come back up and we'll be allowed 15 minutes for rebuttal testimony. Uh, and then we will close the public hearing. The applicant is allowed at least seven more days to submit written testimony. The applicant may waive this right if he or she wants to. Once the city council has allowed all of the procedural rights to the parties and once the city council is satisfied that it has all the evidence it needs, it will then close the public hearing, uh, um, deliberate among themselves and announce the decision. A final decision of the city council may be appealed to the uh, Land Use Board of Appeals. We wish to hear from everyone who's interested in the proposals. However, we, que we, requ we request refraining, refraining from repeating testimony that has already been given by someone else. If you agree that, uh, if you agree with someone else who's gone before you, what they have said, uh, you can ensure that, you're le that you have legal standing in the public record. record. Please come to the, uh, the testimony table, sign in, and we're using these sheets right here. Uh, state your name, address for the record, <coughs> And if you fill this out completely, we're not going to need you to just state your name. Uh, outside of staff and the applicants, public testimony will be limited again to three minutes. Um, we will have time, uh, we will uh, time the testimony and provide you with a visual and I'll raise my hand at five seconds and then when I wave like that, three minutes are up. And David will help me with the, with the timing. Be sure to keep your uh, testimonies relevant to the comprehensive plan and the, six, and the McMinnville City Code of, the, of, of uh, criteria. Also this evening, before we get started, I know this is a passionate topic. 
a lot of time and effort has been uh, placed into uh, preparing testimonies. Um, council has received, and let me repeat this, council has received uh, all public testimony. And uh, we, so it is about eight inches uh, in many of this dual paged and we've had an opportunity to study it. Uh, we've had the big book for about six weeks now and the, the, the two smaller books that uh, coming from staff and then coming from friends of Baker Creek, we've had over two weeks. So uh, we have diligently worked very hard to read and uh, take the testimony that's gone before. Uh, the one comment that I would like to say and have this on record, and I just say it as myself as mayor, uh, I thank staff for the efforts that they have put into uh, taking a quasi-judicial matter that has a lot of moving pieces and breaking that down for the council. I would also like to thank members of the city planning commission for their diligent effort in wanting to be transparent, wanting to listen to testimony. I know many of these individuals personally, I work with many of them on committees and these are individuals that of their own time and uh, volunteer efforts have given to this process that uh, hopefully, uh, so, uh, well, I know supports our, um, munici our municipal code, our comprehensive plan and our municipal code. And so I just wanna thank staff and the plan commission for everything that's gone on before uh, we have this uh, public hearing this evening. So with that being said, um, I am going to open, and I'll read this. Um, tonight, the public hearing for docket number PDA 3-18, PDA 4-18, and, and S318, applicant, applicants requesting approval of two separate plan development uh, amendments and a, a tentative subdivision plan. The city council is considering uh, the recommendation of the planning commission and a decision on the three applications will be made independently against the review criteria that apply to each individual request. But all three applications will be reviewed concurrently in one public hearing because we relate to the same property. Applications PDA 8, 318 is requesting approval to amend a plan development ordinance 422 Oak Ridge plan development to remove the unplotted fourth phase of the Oak Ridge phase of subdivision from the boundary of the Oak Ridge <coughs> plan development overlie district. Application PDA 418 is requesting approval to amend plan development ordinance uh, 4822 Oak Ridge Meadows plan development to add the unplotted fourth phase of the Oak Ridge phase subdivision, the boundary of the Oak Ridge Meadows plan development, allow for lot size averaging, allow for uh, modified set max set for some lots with side lot uh, lines oriented other than at right angles to the street upon which the lot faces allows for some lots to exceed the recommended depth, a uh, lot depth and, uh, to width ratio uh, with some blocks block lengths to exceed the recommended maximum uh, block lake standards allowing for the designately 5.6 public open space greenway dedicated along Baker Creek. Application S3-18 is uh, requesting approval of 108 lot a tentative two-phased uh, single family residential subdivision plan on approximately 35.7 of 47 acres of land with lots ranging between uh, 4,950 to 14,315 square feet in size and averaging 7.771 square feet in size referred as the Oak Ridge Meadows. In addition, an approximately 0.85 acre active private neighborhood park and approximately a 5.6 acre 
public open uh, space greenway dedicated along the Baker Creek are proposed. The subject site is located generally north of Baker Creek Road and the multi-phase Oak Ridge residential development and the, the south of Baker Creek. It is more specifically described as tax lot 602, section seven, tax lot 1300, section 17, T dot, Five S dot four of R four W W M, and so with that being read, we will open the public hearing. Does any councilor wish to make any disclosure or abstain from participating or voting on this application? I'll start down. Do I see any? I see none. Um, <clears throat> Does anyone wish to, uh, to object to the jurisdiction of the city council to hear this matter? Hearing none. Does any councilor need to declare any contact prior to this hearing with the applicant, any other party involved in this hearing or any other source of information outside of staff regarding the subject of this hearing? Um, I would just like to declare the same declar declarations were made by the other councillors at the June 25th meeting in regards to email because I wasn't present at that meeting and have a chance to declare that ex parte contact at the time. Thank you, Remy. Thank you. Remy, were all those emails and communications forwarded on to planning department staff to be included in the record? Yes, they were. Uh, I also, same as Remy, uh, same thing. I passed all my emails on to uh, Heather and uh, really didn't read them, just noted what they were. Yeah, I think anyone, I, I think it, it, to my knowledge, all emails that have been sent to counselors have been sent in and have been put together on our, and are a part of the public record. Uh, the only comment I have, Mayor, is I did not send um, separate emails that I was CC'd on, um, so they should have a complete record of everything that I've received, but I didn't send any, any additional email that other counselors were CC'd on. Thank you. Okay, hearing, uh, hearing no other ex parte or uh, 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 testimony that was, uh, or communication that was received. Have any counselors visited the sites? Raise your hand if you have. Okay, does any counselor wish to discuss their visit to the, the subject site? I know for myself, I've been out there about three times. I've not talked to anyone, but I've traveled the full, the full perimeter as much as you could without doing four wheeling and getting in trouble. So, um, okay. Um, does any counselor have any questions at, of staff at this time? Because we can, we can start that process uh, before their presentation. So in your preparation and your reading, your hit list of questions, you can ask, ask those at this particular time. So I'll just open that up. Okay, at this time, uh, Will uh, staff please give a brief a description of the uh, application? Jeremy, welcome, and Heather. So. Good evening. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor and Councilors. Uh, Heather Richards, Planning Director, and good evening to members of the audience. This is a night for a community dialogue, which is what planning is all about, so it's great to see. Um, we, you have three ordinances in front of you for three separate land use decisions, but they're all for one development project. Um, we went through a presentation with you on June 25th um, to a lengthy staff report at that point in time. We'd like to enter that into the record so that we don't have to give that same presentation tonight. The two city councilors who were not in presence that evening have both watched the video of the meeting and have confirmed that they've seen that in its entirety. So everyone is at the same place in terms of the information that you have. 
Um, we have to, by state law and also our local code, give a staff report. So tonight what we want to do is summarize any new material that we've received since June 25th. We also want to do a really brief summary of the projects themselves because there are new people in the audience tonight just to sort of share what, what you are considering as we move this forward. Um, by state law, we do need to render a decision on these three land use decisions. State law requires we render a decision within 120 days unless the applicant requests an extension. That's in the state law because it ensures timeliness in terms of decision making. Um, the applicant has requested an extension on this land use decision to August 13th, 2019. So they are in their processing time that they have requested an extension uh, brings us out to 201 days since their application application was deemed complete. You're having the public hearing tonight, so what that means is you do have another meeting on August 13th where you have an opportunity to render a decision if you're not in a place to render a decision this evening. With that, I'm going to turn over the presentation to Jamie. He's going to walk you through the projects and some of the um, significant aspects of new information that we've received. I will then follow up with some additional comments, and at that point in time, we'll, we'll sit for questions. I'll just give a brief overview of the three land use decisions uh, in consideration tonight. Uh, Ordinance 5065, uh, PDA 318, uh, is the request to amend uh, the Oak Ridge Plan Development, which is Ordinance 4722, by removing 11.47 acres of undeveloped, unplatted property from that plan development. Ordinance number 5069, or Plan Development Amendment 4-18, would amend the Oak Ridge Meadows Plan Development, uh, Ordinance 4822, originally approved in 2005, by adding the 11.47 acres uh, previously removed from the Oak Ridge Plan Development by um, applying some don zoning departures to the Oak Ridge Meadows plan development and to require some open space amenities. Uh, the zoning departures that would be uh, requested uh, would are adjustments to the average lot size, uh, adjustments to some setbacks, adjustments to some lot sidelines to better to respond to the uh, unique topographic uh, features of the site. Uh, adjustments to the lot depth to width ratio, uh, again, to respond to the geography of the site. Adjustments to the maximum block length, again, to respond to the geography of the site and the requirement of open space amenities. And, and then just if to um, follow up on that, to clarify for everyone, both ordinance number 4722 and 4822 are land use decisions. So tonight in front of you is an amendment to plan developments, but those plan developments have already been approved and developments already been approved for these properties to move forward. Tonight's decision is really whether to amend what's been approved in the past. Uh, the final land use decision uh, before you tonight is Ordinance 5070, the subdivision 3-18, uh, which would uh, take the overall 35.47 acres uh, created by PDA 4-18 and <clears throat> approve a 108 lot single family residential subdivision on that land that's outlined in red there on the screen. Uh, the subdivision would also provide the public and private open space amenities uh, required by PDA 4-18. Uh, Planning Commission did find that all three uh, land use requests met applicable uh, standards and review criteria and recommended approval for all three. Since the June 25th uh, City Council meeting, we at the Planning Department have received 10 new written testimonies um, and they have been entered into the record and provided to the City Council for your consideration. The testimony expressed uh, in those um, testimonies received by the Planning Department uh, expressed concern in opposition to the three land use requests uh, related to three primary issues. Uh, the first being the impact of the development on surrounding street network and transportation system. And in particular, we've heard that uh, many of the uh, 
local residents and the existing neighborhoods uh, surrounding the proposed development uh, feel that the local street standards are uh, would make it too congested for the addition of um, a new neighborhood to the north. <clears throat> Uh, the second issue that uh, was repeated in the testimonies that we received are uh, expressed concern about impact of the development on wetlands and the testimony um, expressed that any impact of wetland is too much impact on the wetland. And then finally, uh, the impact of the development on downstream flooding was a, was a major concern uh, in testimony that has been received. And the concern specifically was that the proposed development uh, of the 108 lot subdivision would increase downstream flooding, particularly in the Crestbrook, Crestbrook neighborhood. Uh, so I'll spend a little, just a little bit of time uh, discussing uh, each of those three uh, primary concerns uh, that have been expressed through the uh, written testimony received and uh, some of the issues around, um, around those concerns. So when we're looking at the impact of the traffic on the development, uh, we're really looking at the street standards that have been adopted by the city of McMinnville in the 2010 transportation system plan. And a particular note is the, um, uh, the standard that is circled in red for local residential streets, which is the maximum average daily traffic, which is a number that we've heard um, <clears throat> come up in testimony and in, um, in the record uh, many times. May I ask a question right now? Yes. Um, so there was a lot of conversation um, in, in the previous meeting about, um, about this number and the, and the six-fold impact um, that it would potentially create. Um, and I was wondering, as a comparative, um, what other uh, local streets currently have a traffic flow of, uh, or, or something comparable to this number? That's Is a that great something? question yes. for Sorry, Mike. <laughs> We're gonna defer that to him. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wouldn't, uh, without gathering data for you, be able to provide specific examples, but um, much of our residential and neighborhoods are developed to local street standards and convey um, areas uh, this size and larger. So this is not an uncommon uh, occurrence um, in the residential areas in town. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, getting to your, your point, Councillor Drabkin, um, we'll discuss um, that number and how it impacts the existing um, existing development in the Oak Ridge um, subdivision just south of the uh, proposed Oak Ridge Meadows development. Uh, you can see the dashed line there on, this, on the map is uh, the portion of Pinot Noir Drive um, that uh, is essentially uh, acts as a, a cul-de-sac. Uh, there's no through connection at the end of that drive, but we know from the approved uh, plan developments from 2000 and 2005 that the intention had always been to extend Pinot Noir Drive into uh, further phases of residential development in, um, on the land that's in question tonight. Um, <clears throat> The existing uh, traffic on that portion of Pinot Noir Drive is approximately 200 average daily trips or average daily traffic. Um, the assumption is that one household generates approximately 9.5 average daily trips and, and there's 18 homes on that end of Pinot Noir Drive before the intersection of Oak Ridge and Pinot Noir Drive. <clears throat> So to your point, Councillor Drapkin, one, one of the things we've heard of concern is it's a big leap from 200 average daily trips to 1,200 ad average daily trips in terms of existing conditions. But the existing condition of Pinot Noir Drive as it's built today is really serving as a private street to these 18 homes because the throughput hasn't been built yet for the rest of the neighborhood that it's supposed to serve. Yep. And so with the addition of the proposed 108 lot subdivision um, with the 108 um, 
households would create just over a thousand average daily trips when added to the approximately 200 or just shy of 200 average daily trips uh, existing on Pinot Noir Drive. Uh, you can see how that reaches the threshold of the 1,200 day, average daily trips uh, right at that intersection of Oak Ridge Drive and Pinot Noir Drive. <clears throat> Question? Yeah, J Jamie, can you please explain the difference between um, the local residential and uh, neighborhood local connector designations in terms of streets? Uh, sure, I would uh, defer that question. Sure. Let's go back to that to Mike. Mm -hmm. So essentially, it's the same cross section of street. It's a 50 foot right away with a 28 foot wide paved section. As traffic increases in situations where um, uh, you're starting to pass that 1,200 um, vehicles per day threshold. You start to look at uh, traffic calming measures that uh, make sure that you have safe pedestrian routes and that um, you have safe intersections to deal with the additional traffic. But there's no physical change to the width of the street um, or the width of the right-of-way when you go from a local street standard to a neighborhood connector street. So, so what you'd be describing is a change to the character of the street, how it's used. Correct, or how it's managed more, more accurately would be you, you start to uh, look at restricting parking uh, further away from intersections so the visibility is increased as traffic flow increases because conflicts inherently increase um, once you start to cross that uh, neighborhood-friendly threshold of about 1,200 vehicles a day. So, so 1,200 is kind of the upper limit of, of a neighborhood street and then kind of the lower limit of what you'd call a connector? Correct. Okay. In our adopted plan. Thank you. Certainly that varies in other communities. Thanks, Mike. Adam. Uh, another question for you, Mike. Would Northwest Oak Ridge Drive be considered a collector then or it's still a just standard street? So if it's carrying 1,200 vehicles per day or less, it's built to a local street standard and it's classified as a local street. If circumstances uh, were to change over time and the traffic flow would increase past that, we'd start to look at some of those other measures that are contained in the neighborhood connector standard. Okay. Uh, Jamie, maybe you'll get to it in a future slide. I haven't skipped ahead. But uh, what's the traffic flow going to be on Oak, Oak Ridge right there with the additional 1,000 ADTs on Pinot Noir Drive? Um, I, I don't have that number off the top of my head, but it's in the, um, I believe it's in the traffic study that has been entered into the, entered into the record by the applicants. Um, Thank you. But we do touch on some of the um, traffic studies that have been uh, presented coming up. And Councillor Garvin, I, be, I believe the applicant's transportation engineer is here this evening. So that's that's a great question to ask of the applicant, those types of details. Okay, thank you. Would this also be a good time to ask about uh, some of the questions on uh, about Shadden that have come up, or should I wait? We, are, we have some slides for that. So as we go through that, that would be a good time to ask those questions. Any further? So go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, so just to recap, uh, the addition of the 108 lots would push uh, that section of Pinot Noir Drive to the threshold of that neighborhood uh, local residential street uh, threshold. <clears throat> And so in the testimony uh, that has been received uh, throughout this process, there has been a, um, a lot of concern expressed about uh, the extension of Shadden Drive um, north into um, <clears throat> into the subdivision to provide a second secondary access to uh, relieve some of that traffic um, stress from Pinot Noir Drive. <clears throat> and uh, in the application, Shadden Drive is scheduled to be an emergency access only uh, to the neighborhood until it is uh, built in um, to full public street standards by Stafford Land Company in their uh, development of Baker Creek North, uh, which is <clears throat> uh, anticipated for the properties uh, just to the southwest of uh, the proposed Oak Ridge Meadows. 
So there's been some confusion about um, Shadden Drive as a secondary emergency access versus being a public road. Um, what we wanted to show you with this slide was that right now the public street network at, as designed serves the average daily trips that are in our local street standards. So the Pino Noir Drive for the maximum allocation of 108 new dwelling units. And it disperses onto Baker Creek in two different ways. However, there's only one access point into the neighborhood. And so so for, for emergency and public safety, there's always the need for two accesses. And you will see a lot of developments around town where there is a secondary emergency access, which is usually not built to a street standard. It's usually built to some sort of gravel standard to withstand, uh, to be able to support the fire vehicle, but it's not supporting daily traffic. And it has, a, it has a locked gate that the fire department has access to. But that's creating that second access into the neighborhood in case the first access is cut off by the event of the fire or something of that nature. So that's a requirement in our code. And so the way the applicant was responding to that requirement is by providing the secondary access. And they had that discussion with the property owner who owns the land that um, Shadden Drive is meant to go through to see if they could use that as an easement for, for their emergency access and pay for the gravel bed to support the fire apparatus when needed. So I, 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 uh, I can appreciate that and, and appreciate that the, that the street is built to, um, or is meant to withstand this amount of um, traffic in the long term. Um, but then also uh, in, uh, and also I, I, I noted that um, in the June 25th meeting, you also talked about um, that, uh, you know, that the city could not require um, the developer um, to, to construct a road on property that, that um, did not belong to them. Um, but then also in thinking about this and, and looking through this, um, you know, what, I, what I'm reading is also a concern about livability, especially during an extended period of um, construction. Um, the, in the opponent's binder, they assert over and over again, um, and I know this will really be a, a question for the developer, but uh, I'd like to bring it up at this time because it's poignant. Um, they, they assert that, um, that there's a, a working relationship there that would allow this street to be built out at this time. Um, and so I'm just wondering if that conversation, to your knowledge, has gone any further, knowing it's a concern um, of uh, the citizenry that lives in, in the nearby neighborhoods. Yeah, so that, that's actually the, the next slide. Um, there has been discussion about can the applicant voluntarily work with the property owner next door to build out Shadden Drive as a public street. We can't require it. We do, there is, in land use law, there is what we call the Nolan-Dolan test. It's a, it's a standard test of proportionality as to what a city or, or jurisdiction can require of a land use development um, in terms of public improvements to support that development. So we can't go above and beyond the test of what is required of that development. And that case law is very strong and it's, it's stood up the case, of, it's, it has stood up through the Supreme Court system. So the proportionality clause is something that uh, it, every land use planner is aware of. So right now we don't have the ability to require it because we show from our local street standards that this development meets the standards of our code in terms of the number of units and the number of average daily trips occurring on Pinot Noir Drive. Uh, in terms of Shadden Drive, there was some discussion of it's going to be built immediately with the new development with Baker Creek North. Um, we got the Baker Creek North proposal in midway through the planning commission. So between the first planning commission hearing and the second planning commission hearing, we had not seen anything about phasing relative to Baker Creek North until we got the application. And we have sat down with the developer and asked about it a little bit further. So the first portion of Shadden Drive will be built in the first phase of Baker Creek North when they start moving forward with that phase 1A to serve that development. The last portion of Shadden Drive will be the last phase built in that development. And so they're estimating it's anywhere between five and 10 years based on how fast they build that development. And the reason for that is because of um, uh, wastewater conveyance and, and how the how wastewater conveyance and that development's going to be served by the infrastructure and, and because of that the properties that are the hardest to serve will be the ones just north of 
on that second phase of Shadden Drive. So that's why that's later in the development. Um, in terms of the discussion that happened between the developer, so the applicant in this particular proposal and the Stafford Land Company, we weren't privy to that, we weren't part of that, um, so we don't know if those discussions took place or not. That's a great question to have of the applicant, but per the Nolan Dolan test, we don't think that there's the capability of the city to require that road be built to a full, complete road standard to support the Oak Ridge Meadows development when this um, development was approved initially and was Pinehurst going to be that second? What was the access before Shadden? The, the requirement was for this, again, this secondary emergency access. There was, so there wasn't a requirement to build a second public street to serve the neighborhood. It was a requirement to have the emergency secondary access as right. well. Oh, so previously, was it still that Shadden Drive? In the, and when it was originally before 2007 or 2008, when it was originally approved, what was the second emergency access at that point? Might have missed it in the... So back in 2005? Yeah. Right, so the, there, there, was a, um, there was a plan to do a secondary emergency access through some of the planned lots that are um, meant to be built out there east of Pinehurst Drive mm -hmm. as a secondary emergency access onto Pinehurst Drive. Then as, as, the, as the neighborhood developed and the public street network came to bear, then, the, then those lots would be built out and the second public street would serve as a secondary access. I believe Mike might know better than me than that. Well, the whole configuration of the lots were different to allow for two accesses at that point. Both. They were. They always planned to build those lots eventually, but they were they were going to be initially used as emergency access. But again, great question to ask of the applicant in terms of intentions. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Jamie. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, so this slide just depicts um, what has been studied uh, by the uh, applicant's traffic engineer in terms of um, intersections and uh, compliance to city standards for uh, the traffic network of the surrounding neighborhoods. So each of those green diamonds is a intersection that was studied uh, that has been uh, shown to meet the standards for level of service and um, the volume to capacity ratio uh, for, uh, for those particular intersections. And again, the dashed line uh, along Pinot Noir Drive just indicates that that is the portion of of Pinot Noir Drive that would approach the threshold of the 1,200 average daily trips. <clears throat> and it's this, uh, this meeting of the standards uh, for these intersections and roads uh, that does seem to prevent the uh, requirement of the Shadden Drive initially. <laughs> Uh, the second uh, issue uh, that came up over and over again in uh, public testimony that, uh, that we received was uh, impact on the wetlands that are present on the site. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so uh, this is uh, zoomed in on a portion of the 11.47 acre uh, parcel. Outlined in blue is a uh, common area tract that would be preserved open space. Uh, the dark gray on the, on the screen is delineated wetland. Uh, so you can see that um, overall on the site, there's 3.09 acres of delineated wetlands, uh, 2.03 acres of which would be preserved in that uh, blue shaded uh, tract and 1.06 acres would be impacted uh, for construction of uh, the road and home lots. Uh, the impacted wetland is primarily on the periphery of the wetland um, and is primarily for the road and uh, it would leave uh, the majority of the wetland uh, intact uh, and it would be contiguously intact at that. <clears throat> Any impact um, that is uh, proposed and approved by uh, Department of State Lands, which is the regulatory authority for wetland permitting, uh, would have a required compensatory mitigation associated with that. <clears throat> 
Uh, so staff spent, spent some time looking at uh, the precedent for mitigated wetlands in McMinnville uh, relative to development. And we were able to uh, receive from uh, DSL a uh, list of <clears throat> sites and properties where uh, DSL permitting and compensatory mitigation for impact on wetlands and waters of the state had been approved and uh, had gone through the permitting process. And these include residential subdivisions, commercial developments, and municipal uh, properties and developments. <clears throat> So I will point out that uh, there's no city policy that does not allow wetland impact and mitigation. Um, the DSL permitting process is uh, set up to help balance the need for development and uh, densification within the urban growth boundary while protecting these uh, ecologically sensitive sites. Um, and we were able to find several examples of developments that are similar to the proposed uh, Oak Ridge Meadows development in terms of uh, wetland impact um, <clears throat> around the periphery to accommodate roads and uh, housing developments while also preserving uh, large portions of contiguous wetland. And also I should note that uh, part of the DSL permitting process is to uh, demonstrate uh, minimal impact on those wetlands. So these are photos of the Bixler and Gerhardt subdivisions in Northeast McMinnville. And on the right is a photo of Northeast Grand Haven Drive uh, that's adjacent to the uh, wetland there on the left that you can see with the, with the tree snags in it. <clears throat> Uh, similar to uh, the condition of the proposed Pinehurst Drive adjacent to the wetlands. And that went through the mitigation and permitting process through DSL. Similarly, Horizon Heights subdivision uh, out by 2nd Street and uh, Hill Road um, went through this process. On the right-hand side, you can see Northwest Horizon Drive adjacent to the wetland area um, beyond the, the hedgerow and those trees. <clears throat> And then um, the Oak Ridge subdivision and Crestbrook first edition subdivisions also at the time of development went through DSL permitting uh, to allow um, <clears throat> impact to wetlands and waters of the state. And both of these subdivisions also required um, compensatory mitigation for uh, the construction of roads and residential development um, that impacted wetlands. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the floodplain and downstream flooding. Um, however, before we start that, I, uh, I wanted to, I think Councillor Garvin, Councillor Peralta, you found this information in the staff report, but you asked a question and we, we didn't have the answer for you, but it was relative to Northwest Oak Ridge Meadow Drive and the number of uh, trips on that. Um, so page, 51 of uh, 83 in ordinance 5069 actually has a table for that and it shows that uh, the traffic on Pinot Noir Drive for that one section that's built out today is actually where you have the most trips, 1200, because then it starts to disperse through the network and, and make its way to Baker Creek Road through the two different dispersion points. And it shows um, the number of trips prior to Shadden Drive being built and then after Shadden Drive being built. So none of those act those roads actually um, meet or exceed 1,200 average daily trips based on the analysis that the applicant did. So apologies, we didn't have that at the time. So that was page 51 of 83 in which section? Ordinance number 5069. Uh, it's in the new the newest uh, grouping that we received. It's, it's also in your the the original in the big book uh -huh. unless yeah. you replace yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. So, 
Thank now that you're all looking at that, if we can <laughs> talk about floodplains. Um, so floodplain and downstream flooding has been a um, concern throughout this whole process in terms of the impact of this proposed development on the floodplain, uh, development that's in the floodplain, and then what the impact would mean for neighborhoods downstream uh, in terms of flooding. Um, so we're gonna walk through this a little bit, but um, what came to bear at the planning commission level is Friends of Baker Creek did commission a hydrologic report and the hydrologic report um, showed that they're based on data, new data, so the data hasn't been up updated in McMinnville um, for this basin in terms of the FEMA data since uh, the mid 80s more or less. And so with an update of the data, it did show that there's valid concerns about the floodplain itself in terms of the extent of the floodplain. It also did show that the development didn't have significant impact on the neighborhoods downstream in terms of flooding. But we wanna walk through the discussion so that um, we've had a lot of um, discussion since the meeting on June 25th. The direction you gave us on June 25th is spend some more time exploring this and finding do more research on what this means for both the city and the developments and the surrounding neighborhoods. Um, so we have been speaking with officials at FEMA and at the Department of Land Conservation and Development in terms of the floodplain management for the state to understand this a little bit better. So the way um, the state operates with FEMA is the state of Oregon has designated staff that act as risk risk mappers and floodplain managers and they're, they are housed in the Department of Land Conservation and Development and then FEMA Region 10 is the region that oversees this area. So you have a copy of, you have the names of the people that we've been in dialogue regarding this issue um, through this and it's been staff from both. It's been both staff that look at land use issues and then uh, engineers as well. So one of the discussions that came up that's a new discussion since June 25th that's in your public testimony is, is a concern about stormwater runoff and whether or not storm run, water runoff could contribute to more flooding in this area in terms of the way the system is designed and built, um, both for the development and for the neighborhoods downstream of it. And there was some, um, we, we provided as an attachment some of the emails uh, that were going back and forth between the city engineer and um, one of the, um, um, people who, testif who has testified for this development uh, in terms of trying to understand what the stormwater system looks like in terms of the runoff and how it affects this particular basin. So most of the new development that's occurred in this area doesn't actually, in terms of stormwater, doesn't actually drain into this basin itself. Most, most of it is draining south of this basin. So the new development for Hill Road and the new subdivisions that are just south of Hill Road for Baker Creek East and Baker Creek West. Uh, the last development that was built that drains into this particular basin for stormwater is um, has, has not been developed since 2010. Um, and then the next development would just be this development that we're talking about tonight. Um, so if you have any further questions about stormwater, um, the city, Mike is here and he can answer those for you. We have provided a map for you that Mike provided to the, um, to the person who was testifying that shows the stormwater system itself and where there's capacity and where there's um, concerns in terms of constraints. The concerns you see on there, if you can see the map, are, are the ones that are green, yellow, and red. Uh, red being the most concerned in terms of constraints and green and yellow uh, being lesser degrees of that. And those are in different basins than the one that this is in. <clears throat> I, I guess the question I might have for Mike, where we have constraint, is there a, is that when there's a possibility of overflowing or just capacity within the pipes in the stream, uh, uh, the storm, uh, water storm uh, drainage system? So the uh, stormwater master plan, much like our uh, transportation system plan and our wastewater master plan, uh, did a capacity analysis, a full build out of the city mm -hmm. and uh, considered a design storm for rainfall. Uh, and so the simple answer is uh, it's likely a future capacity issue. There were a few pipes in the uh, master plan that were identified as current challenges, and none of those are in the basin that's shown on the screen. So. Um, most of the constraints are identified as future constraints when the city is fully built out. 
and, the, and those are completely piped, so there's never a concern of overflow per se. The overflow that might happen in a big downpour would happen out at the reclamation center or, or, or area. No, that's a wastewater system. Okay. Which is separate from the stormwater system, and they're, uh, and it's based on a design storm. So uh, if we have rainfall events that exceed the design storm, our system will likely fail in several areas uh, and overflow, um, and that's from a stormwater standpoint. Correct. Wastewater is a completely different piped system, and it too is also designed for a certain uh, uh, peak flow. And if we have uh, groundwater and infiltration that add to the wastewater system um, during that peak flow, there is potential for overflow of the wastewater system. And there are a number of places in the wastewater system where overflows could occur. Um, one of them is at the treatment plant, but also at other locations within the system. There aren't wastewater concerns in this basin, and, and, that, and that's not part of the testimony you're receiving uh, this evening. Thank you, Mike. So one of the um, issues brought up with the hydraulic analysis was that the floodplain could could be larger than what's identified in the FEMA floodplain maps adopted um, on March 2nd, 2010. And so per your direction, we worked with uh, the, the staff members from DLCD and FEMA to evaluate what this means for this city. Um, we wanted to understand, one, the validity of the report and the conclusions in the report. Uh, we wanted to understand what's the safety of the built environment in the floodplain if the floodplain has expanded, and then what can McMinnville require of the applicant? Those are all very different questions with very different answers because um, per Oregon state law, we have to review an application based on what's our regulations at the time that the application is submitted. And, and there was um, an inference in the newspaper that it's based on when the application was originally submitted back in 2000, 2005. We're actually reviewing this plan development amendment based on the, the regulations that are in place when the plan development amendment has been submitted. So I just wanted to clarify that. Um, but anyways, with that said, we can't go beyond that. And, and so for the city, we have to review it from that perspective. But we did want to be able to answer these questions and have a dialogue about it. <coughs> so in terms of the validity of the report and the conclusions, um, FEMA contracts with an engineer through the state of Oregon to provide services to cities like the city of McMinnville to review these types of reports. So we did have them do a third party review um, of what the report was and, and visit with us about what, what it said. Um, and essentially it said what the ex executive summary that um, PBS has in the report as well as in the rebuttal, which is that the data is old. Uh, the, the new data shows that there could be changes to the floodplain and so the city should should move forward with further evaluation. The hydraulics report isn't enough data to support a what we call letter of map revision. So it's not, um, it doesn't have the specificity to um, to submit to FEMA to, to move forward with the letter of map revision, but it does show the concerns um, in terms of we should be looking at this further as a city moving forward. Um, and that uh, we should be looking at our FEMA firm panels as well. Our FEMA firm panels were modernized in March 2nd, 2010. Uh, the FEMA has been going through that process throughout the state of Oregon. They haven't finished that yet. We did ask for a grant with FEMA last year, um, not based on this proposal, but just based on the fact that we're going through this growth analysis and we wanted to understand stand things a little bit better in terms of natural hazards in McMinnville. Um, so we'd asked for a grant from FEMA to both both do floodplain analysis and landslide susceptibility analysis, and we were turned down for that grant. We made it into the final round, and we were turned down for that. Um, we are working with FEMA right now to see if we can be more competitive in the next round of grants so we can bring those funds into the community. Um, the other thing that the report says, though, is that pr the proposed development, so the development at full build out as proposed, would not increase downstream flooding. Can I go back to the FEMA firm panels here for a yeah. moment? So um, I believe that I read it would be uh, about six to eight months to not not to do it citywide, but specific to this development, it would take about six to eight months to, to get new FEMA firm panels for this 
So, so the six to eight months would be the review process for FEMA for a letter of map revision. So letter of map revisions are submitted by property owners, they're submitted by developers, they can be submitted by cities to look at, to say in this specific spot, we've done this type of analysis to show that the floodplain is this. Typically it's to extract property from the floodplain or it could be to see if the floodplain has expanded. However, to to get the information together to submit for the letter of map revision. And, and this is the discussion of um, the hydraulic report. And again, it's I, I believe the applicant might have some experts here who can talk about this um, a little bit better, but the, the letter of map revision needs two different analysis associated with it. It needs a hydrologic report and it needs a hydraulic report. And so this does not have the hydraulic report. And the hydraulic report is looking at uh, the symmetry of the floodway. So, you know, what's the channel look like in terms of how it can carry water? Uh, they, they, were, they were looking at an analysis that shoots off the water rather than down into the channel itself. Typically that's done in areas like this by actually going out and doing ground surveys, which is somewhat labor intensive. Uh, it's also looking at bridge crossings and things like that that are also in the basin. So it's, it's looking a little bit deeper and a little bit more refined in terms of the analysis. And then those two pieces are submitted to FEMA to do a letter of map revision. And so then what's the, what's the time frame for uh, the new FEMA firm panels, because that's different than the letter of map revision. So the time frame for new FEMA firm panels, if the city wanted to move forward with our own resources to do that, that's still a five to 10 year review. Five to 10 years, okay. Mm -hmm. But that, that is a, that's a citywide analysis. So that you can't do that piece by piece the same way that you can do the letter of map review. We could probably do a letter of map revision piece by piece throughout the whole city if that's something that we chose to do. Okay. And it would be six to eight months per, per and and we would and uh, an analysis that's site specific that's the hydrologic analysis and the hydraulic analysis. And those are all things so in terms of um, there's two separations of discussions here. There's the, the discussion relevant to this land use application and the decision making process associated with that. And in our code, we we use the flood. We have a floodplain zone, so we put all of our all the land that's in the FEMA firm map panels that were adopted in March 2nd, 2010, were rezoned into a floodplain zone, and that zone operates just like the R1 zone, R2 zone, R3 zone. And so it says in that what can and cannot happen in the floodplain and we do not allow development in the floodplain. That's how we manage it. Um, however, we can't say just because this report has said the floodplain may have expanded that it's now in the floodplain zone and we can't allow development because we want one, we haven't rezoned the property into the floodplain zone. And two, we don't have definitive analysis to do that at this point in time. So what we can do is talk about, you know, what does it mean in terms of what we want to ensure? And that's the next two part test of, of what we went through in terms of these three parts is we want to ensure safety for structures that are built, so we want to make sure we do that um, moving forward. And so the, I'll walk you through what we discovered from that process. But um, we can't we, we can't apply our floodplain zone management practices to the property that's in this land use proposal that's not in the floodplain because that's not how our ordinance is constructed right now. The, the land that's in the floodplain that's part of the subject site is being dedicated to the city to be maintained as a greenway. We have a comprehensive plan policy that talks about when there's land division standards, which is what a subdivision is, that the city then has as that land dedicate to the city so the city can continue to manage the floodplain. Right, well, I, I mean, my, my questions are relative to time frame because, um, you know, of course I've read the, the revisions and the removal of the five properties that, that are in the floodplain, um, but in thinking about the, the, the long-term um, build out um, and that, you know, you don't build over a hundred houses in, in in six to eight months. I'm uh, I'm curious if if that process was to begin now, um, if then not only the city but the developer would be aware of any other houses that might 
um, or any other properties that might be in the floodplain um, before development, as opposed to to waiting to begin that process or doing it specific to um, to each uh, each lot. Yeah, and so all the applicant is here tonight, and they have a presentation for you. They have done some analysis, so um, you know no developer wants to put themselves as at risk as well. Um, and so b based on the PBS report, there were concerns, and they have done their own analysis, and they can share that with you. Um, so this, the second test was the safety of the built environment in the floodplain. So there, so what? What, um, oh, I don't have that map yet. What that uh, PBS analysis showed was that there were five lots in this proposal that could potentially be an expanded floodplain. And so, you know, we can, as a city, allow development to occur on lots that are in the floodplain. There are many cities where that's their floodplain management system, but you just have to build it a different way. So you need to make sure that the lowest floor elevation is above the base flood elevation. So basically where people are occupying is above the base flood elevation, and there's different construction codes associated with it and standards. And we provided you with a sample of the Oregon model floodplain ordinance uh, that shows how construction can occur in these floodplains, and there are many cities that allow it. Um, so that was a way we could move forward where we said, you know, if you're building in, the in what could potentially be a floodplain, you build to this standard. The state model code standard is a higher standard. So the federal government, FEMA, also has standards for building in the floodplain, and the state of Oregon's model code standard is a higher standard for that development in the floodplain than FEMA, so they take it a step further. So then the question is, what can McMinnville require of the applicant? So as I just described, we had that discussion with both DLCD and FEMA staff because we wanted to understand, are there any federal regulations or state regulations where it says if there, a report like this has been brought forward, we can, we can then apply further requirements to the land use proposal? And both the DLCD and FEMA staff said that they, they expressed their concerns that we cannot put those additional conditions on a land use proposal if it's not supported by our current adopted ordinances. Um, they didn't feel that would be legally tenable. Our current floodplain ordinances were all put together and acknowledged by both the state in terms of their floodplain management program as well as FEMA before we adopted them. With that said, in land use, the applicant can be asked to agree to a condition. So we can't require it, but we can say, we can, if they agree to a condition, then they're agreeing to it being as part of the land use decision. So you'll see that in the staff report, what we did based on your direction is we provided it what we would recommend as a proposed condition to kind of address this issue of, you know, safety of building in the floodplain so that we're making sure that there are no structures being built in such a way that they would be compromised by this potentially expanded floodplain. So we put a condition in the staff report that talked about if structures are built in this extended floodplain, that um, we would like to see the Oregon model flood damage prevent the standards of the Oregon model code be used in terms of the construction for that. So the applicant contacted us. Um, and they had similar concerns in terms of building in the floodplain. And so they had, when the, when the PBS report first came out at the planning commission level between the two different uh, public hearings, um, the applicant came forward with a revised subdivision plan to remove those five lots that were in question that were in this expanded floodplain and place them somewhere else in the subdivision. At the time at the planning commission they were looking at it, they decided that, that, that it was something that had been presented to them um, at the last minute before the last public hearing and they wanted to um, move forward the decision and recommendation to city council, keep that as part of the public record and continue to have dialogue at the city council level, but they didn't feel they had enough time to review it at their level. The applicant also agreed to some conditions of approval that would do two things. So there's an agreed upon condition of approval that you've received in a memo and that's been posted to the public record that would mitigate risk of flooding of lots in the proposed sub subdivision. So what it, the applicant has agreed to do is not to build 
structures on any of the land that's that's identified as being potentially expanded floodplain, and we have a condition that describes that. And they've also agreed to a condition of approval to mitigate development that increases downstream flooding. So they've agreed to a condition of approval in terms of having a professionally engineered and certified report that shows that their development will not impact, uh, will not increase uh, flooding downstream of the development. And is that is there a specific is there a specific methodology that goes along with that? Since methodology was one of the things that was called into question originally, mm -hmm. okay. so you will see that in the condition, and and the engineer is here tonight for the applicant. So the first condition is um, that that they've agreed to, and that we're recommending to you this evening is a, a new condition for both the plan development amendment 4-18 and the subdivision 3-18 uh, that the applicant removes lots 34, 30. 45, 41, 42, and 43. Those are the five lots in question um, as they are depicted on the application site plan exhibit six and replace them elsewhere within the subdivision uh, in substantial conformance with the site plan as shown as exhibit six alt and we'll show you that. What that does is it still retains the standards that are in the original plan development amendment in terms of uh, an average lot size that we're trying to achieve in this plan development. It will be a little bit smaller. It will go down to 7,302, but it's a still larger than the 7,000 square foot uh, lot size of the R2 zone. And then uh, the smallest lot size would be 3,793. So it will add, what it does is it takes five large lots and creates 10 smaller lots out of it. Um, and then it also provides a greater variety of housing in, this, in the subdivision as well. Um, and the other thing it will do is it will create more lots that are less than 7,000 7, square feet, so presumably providing more affordable housing in the development. This was entered into the record at the Planning Commission public hearing. We also provided as part of the record at your June 25th staff report and presentation um, as well. And then in terms of the um, downstream flooding, the new condition would be an additional condition as part of the plan development 4-18. So this is stuff that needs to be achieved before the subdivision. The applicant shall provide a professionally engineered and certified hydrologic and hydro hydraulic evaluation of Baker Creek in the immediate vicinity of the subject pro property that complies with FEMA standards. So to your question, Councillor Drapkin. Uh, for a detailed flood study to ensure that the proposed lots as depicted in the application site plan in the uh, uh, the alternative six will not be subject to flooding during the 1% annual chance, so the 100-year floodplain. And the applicant shall also provide a professionally engineered and certified report that the proposed development will not increase the flood risk of adjacent and downstream properties. So there are standards in which those two reports are, are conducted in terms of methodology and this can would require that those, those reports be done within those standards. And then based on that, there's a new condition recommended or amended condition recommended for subdivision 3-18. This is re recommend, this is, there was some um, numbering change based on the, the um, reallocation of the lots. And so this just changes the phasing in terms of the number of lots that are in phase one and the number of lots that are in phase two. So those two agreed upon conditions, what they do is it, it ensures one, that no structures are being built in a floodplain, and then ensures two, that this, this development as developed will not create downstream flooding. So there won't, there won't be increased downstream flooding based on this development itself. There are concerns in the neighborhoods that are downstream of Baker Creek that they've had increased flood events um, there, especially in the last five to 10 years, and that's a discussion we need to have as a city. But this particular development and land use um, proposal based on these conditions, they will be providing the reports that are certified under FEMA standards to show that this will not create downstream flooding. So in terms of the five lots they're removing, they're removing the five lots in red, um, and they are uh, taking the um, five lots that were just east of Pinehurst Drive overlooking the preserved wetland and creating 10 lots in that space. 
The other thing this does by removing the five lots in red, it does remove two lots that were proposed to be developed, developed that impacted the wetland. Uh, so it, it increases the preserved wetland um, area and continues to maintain that contiguous wetland. So the, it reduces the wetland impact from a mitigation of 1.06 acres to approximately 0 0.9 acres. And then it provides a no-rise certification. So this is that FEMA standard that verifies that development has zero downstream impact on floodplains. Can you talk a little bit about the wetland area that appears in lots three, four, five, six, eight, and nine um, on six alt? Yeah, that's just east of Pinehurst Drive. Yes. So that's the that is uh, that's the planned mitigated wetland to support the development. That's the same wetland that was approved for being mitigated for the original plan development. So the, so Pinehurst Drive and the, and the development of lots east of Pinehurst Drive have always been part of this development proposal. So how do you deal with something like say lot six where the wetland area that's identified is right in the center of the lot. Is it a situation where it would be it would be filled in essentially mm -hmm. in order to build on top of it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. And that's similar to those those pictures Jamie was showing you in terms of the roads and the the homes that were just adjacent to those roads. That was that was fill that was brought in to support that development. Okay. <clears throat> So in terms of next steps, um, you're holding the public hearing tonight. Um, you, you are under a time frame in terms of a decision-making process, so you do have one more scheduled city council meeting in which to make a decision where you can elect to um, conduct this or not conduct the second reading of the ordinance. Um, you can vote to adopt or not adopt the ordinances themselves, um, and that concludes our presentation. Okay, any specific questions for Heather or Jamie at this point? The staff? Yeah. Wendy? I have a question. Um, can you tell me a little bit, and we talked a little bit about this at the previous um, meeting, but um, with regards to the department, I know the Department of State Lands is the one that will determine what, what the requirements are and approve whether or not they can develop in those areas that are wetlands and what they need to do in order to do that. Um, what is, do they, is there ever a time that the State Department will decline altogether? Or like what is the, can you tell just a little bit about the criteria they use in determining? Because I, a, a significant portion of the concern is that the wetlands aren't being protected. And there obviously is a, a process that they are using to determine if it's valid. Yeah, so I'm, I'm not gonna pretend to be an expert on wetlands. Um, the, the city of McMinnville does not um, manage a wetland program. Um, and we have always deferred to the division of state lands to administer, manage, and enforce the program because that is where the experts lay and uh, most cities defer to them for that. Um, what I can tell you in my experience though is the, the DSL is going to approach it as, as um, so they have to balance development and preservation of wetland. And so they're going to balance it in such a way where avoidance is the best mitigation avoid the wetland as much as possible. Um, design your proposal in such a way that you are avoiding it as much as possible, but they also don't want to prevent development from moving forward due to mitigation of wetland. They're going to look at the type of wetland um, in terms of the quality of the wetland, the, and that's why you'll see a lot of the peripheral um, wetland mitigation occurring rather than going in and developing in the pond area there in this particular site. Um, and things of that nature. So they they will they have a system in which they qualify the different types of wetlands that they have, and and the and they have priority structures in terms of preservation. Did you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, I also know that uh, part of the DSL process is to review. Um, um, multiple options uh, to. Um, see if there is options that can avoid wetland altogether or if there is an option that is um, more impactful or less impactful and um, 
and they weigh their their permitting decisions based on multiple multiple options provided by provided by the applicant at that time. Okay. And there's um, I I don't remember where I read it, but at one point the mitigation failed or some mitigation failed. What happens when that happens? Is there a new approach that's taken or? Do you, do you know about that? Yeah. <laughs> if you don't, it's okay. That, that <laughs> I know might I'm be asking a good, you a good question for the applicant who can describe their past experience okay. with the failed mitigation on the site. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. And thank you for taking a stab at it. I know it's not your expertise, what you guys do. In terms of process, that's also involved in the testimony. Um, typically, the land use process happens first. We wanted to have the wetland delineation so that there was awareness of what the proposal's impact to the wetland would be. So we did declare this application incomplete until they were able to provide that. They provided initially as mapping um, and then provided the analysis when that was complete. Um, but then in terms of the wetland mitigation itself and, and how that is submitted to DSL and is approved through DSL, that is, that is a typical process that will occur after a land use decision uh, because there's a lot of investment in that process and uh, they want to see if the, the decision has gone forward on the local level. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I'm going to ask a question uh, not specific to the application itself um, and perhaps a bit taboo, but um, once I get shaken off, I'm going to do it anyways. Um, <laughs> Has either or both parties indicated to uh, planning staff at any point that if the um, outcome isn't to their uh, uh, desired end that they would appeal our decision? If you're talking about parties being applicants versus opponents, are those yeah. the two parties? Um, no, so we, we haven't had that discussion with either group of people. We do know both groups have uh, engaged lawyers. Okay, thank you. Other discussions or questions? Wendy? Yeah, I have one more question. Um, so there, in some of the uh, testimony, there was concern about the um, Pinehurst Drive that um, stops at less uh, toss mm -hmm. property that we that road and I and I don't think because that's not an emergency access and it's not really part of this application it's a little bit outside of it it's just for my information there was concerned that that road would not be able to go across that property because of the wetlands there um, if that were I mean a concern that came up that there was movement what would the city do in that instance when it did come time to complete that road and maybe this is a question for you Mike has that ever happened that we've had con intentions to put a road in and that we've had to change course? I'm not sure I'm following the question. Um, I know, um, and Heather or Jamie can speak to this, we do have uh, provisions within our zoning ordinances that require um, uh, adjacent properties be served by not only the road network, but by utility networks as mm -hmm. well. And so, although there's no intention now for that property to develop, at some point in the future, it is within our urban growth boundary and it is planned for residential development mm -hmm. and it will need to be served by streets and by utilities. Mm -hmm. I guess the uh, concern that was expressed was that the, if the floodplain had moved in the time since we had put the road in there, that uh, the concern is that that road wouldn't be able to be completed for, like if conditions had changed. As, have we ever run into that? That was my question. Not that I'm aware of. Okay, thank you. Okay, it looks like uh, we have no further questions for staff. So uh, Jamie and Heather, thank you for your presentation and the thoroughness of the information that you've given to us. Thank you. Um, let's, uh, we've, we're seeing a few counselors get up. Let's take a five minute break, uh, just to give people an upper opportunity to stand up before we get into the, the public hearing piece. So it right now is 825. So we will reconvene at 830.
got a little monster in here. I don't even catch it. Oh, that was a better call. If everybody could take their seats, we'd like to get started. Thank you very much. I'm not going to sit here and eat candy all night. Is there more sand? Way to go, Davy boy. Looking out for you. Okay, we have our counselors back up. Okay, we know that the applicant would like to provide testimony, so Lori and Wendy are up at the desk. Welcome. Thank you. And then anyone from your team, we've got 20 minutes, so if you can keep your dialogue to 20 minutes, again, any questions <laughs> or answers, we'll stop the clock on that. So go ahead, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Lori Zumwalt. Uh, my husband, Jeff, and I are the owners and applicant of uh, Premier Development. Um, Jeff and I have been born and raised in McMinnville, and so we care deeply about our community here. We've built many homes in McMinnville as well as many communities in McMinnville, and we want this community to be a success as well as the other ones have. Um, we've listened to the opponent's testimony, and we've made alterations to our plan to make it the best uh, subdivision we can do. Um, so there we are. Uh, we, we hope for an approval tonight from you as well. Um, I can answer um, Councillor Drapkin's question, I believe, in regards to Shadden Drive. I've had conversations over the months with uh, Gordon Root, who's the owner of Stafford Lands, and he is adamantly opposed to us having Shadden Drive be a ongoing access for the community um, and only allows for an easement for emergency access. And have you had that conversation also specific to construction vehicles? Yes, and his contention was that um, he's gonna be doing his own construction, having his own ditches and pipes and all you know going on and we're gonna be driving through that and. It's just not very feasible to do it at, at this time. Okay, I have a team of experts here. Uh, Wendy Kellington is our, my attorney. She'll be doing an overview. Overview. Um, I have traffic, wetlands, and uh, flood, and an engineer here, and they're all in the, in the front row, and as, as well as uh, Ron Pomeroy, the my planning consultant. So we're all here to answer questions. So do you have a presentation that you're going to go through briefly and yes okay thank you so uh, to kind of kick it off we believe that the applicant has demonstrated that all three of the proposals satisfy all approval standards as your staff has so ably described to you and the ultimate issue is does the development meet the adopted and acknowledged standards in the city's code and if the answer is yes then the city must approve the application and we think that your planning commission your professional staff uh, got it right and that the application meets all standards we have a conducted extensive studies related to the project, transportation studies, hydrology studies, wetland studies, stormwater studies, all of that to ensure the proposal satisfies all applicable standards. And of course, the staff report concludes that all standards are met. I want to quickly go over that the goalpost rule is an important one, and I know the opponents disagree with that requirement and have asked that you ignore it um, because your, your code standards are allegedly out of date. Uh, 
but you have to apply the standards that are in effect at the time the application was submitted, and there's a really good reason for that. And that provides some level of predictability, consistency, and fairness in this quasi-judicial land use process. So that means we're gonna apply the adopted plan and acknowledged plan, TSP, and zoning ordinance. So what does the evidence in the record say with regard to flood? There is no dispute in this record that there is no development that is proposed within the city's adopted uh, FEMA 100-year floodplain. The current adopted FEMA maps were indeed carefully prepared as the staff report states that they were uh, done as a part of a statewide effort, that there was a three-year process, that the public was integrally involved. These weren't fly-by-night standards. And then the staff report correctly concludes that not only does the proposal not develop in the city's floodplain, but it also dedicates the entire floodplain to the city of McMinnville as a natural greenway park, an amenity that otherwise does not exist. Now the proposal simply does not cause any flooding. The West Tech engineering uh, firm has provided a stormwater technical response. You heard from your, uh, your staff that the stormwater detention and uh, excess stormwater will flow to Baker Creek as required by the city's plan, having no downstream impacts. Uh, and that is even confirmed by the opponent's hydrologist. And there isn't even any dispute that if you ignored all of your adopted FEMA's flood standards and you just looked at the opponent's PBS report and it shows the worst case, nobody disputes it shows the worst possible case, that approval of the development as it was originally proposed has no perceptible downstream impacts. According to the PBS report, the proposal either results in a decrease in flooding, that's on one page of the P PGS report, or it adds no more than one one hundredth of a foot, one eighth of an inch to the flood elevation. There's no perceptible problems. Regardless, let's take this issue away. We want to take the issue away. We agree with the staff that a voluntary condition completely resolves the matter and we are willing to accept and we ask the city to impose the conditions that your staff went through. And one of those conditions assures you of the things that you have expressed concern about tonight and that is that professional engineers will provide a certified study of the hydrology and, and, and the hydraulic uh, works of the immediate vicinity of Baker Creek around this development to ensure that the proposed lots do not uh, increase the 100-year floodplain and also will certify one better that um, the proposed development does not increase the flood risk at all for adjacent or downstream properties. The benefits of doing it this way is that it completely resolves the concerns that have been a central issue in this case. And with these conditions, there is simple, simply no possibility of a 100-year flood issue. It reduces wetland impact from 1.06 acres of filled wetland to 0.9 acres. When you remove those lots, two of them had some fill. And it maintains the density expectations, although you're still 16 fewer lots than the 206 lots that are currently approved, it still maintains 108 lots in the subdivision. Now we know the real elephant in the room is that there are concerns about views. The opponents primarily live adjacent to the proposed development and they object to the view should impacts. View is not a relevant standard under any city code provision, but regardless, the features that the opponents say they want to pre preserve are largely left intact. Excuse me, I'd like to ask a question right now. Yes. Have we received any testimony regarding views? Yeah, no. I didn't read any, but. Okay, thank you. So it appeared to us, we've been trying to figure out what, what the issues are, and it appeared to us based on the photographs and the record and the issues that were raised by opponents that they're really concerned about what this will look like from their, from their homes. And so to the extent you were worried about it, we wanted to go over that a little bit and to assuage your concerns. So there is no development that is proposed where the water is, and this upland area in this particular photograph is where the proposed park is situated. There's no development where the water is here either. We know that that's been of great concern. 
Here is the area to be developed in the 11.4 acre portion that has been of concern. As you can see, the completed development will look a lot like the street at the end of the green arrow. And the development will occur where the bigger blue arrows are up to the sort of uh, frowny face, if you will, the frowny face red line. And then it drops off steeply. Many of you said that you've been out to the property into um, a wetland area. That's the big wetland area, the area from the, the upside down, the U uh, downward, and that will remain intact. The wetlands uh, in the cul-de-sac, we are giving you sort of an image of what those look like. They are not wet all year long. They dry up, and that was one of the problems with the mitigation is that the area just doesn't stay wet enough. But this gives you kind of an image of what the wetlands that we were going to fill for lots, uh, the two lots that were in the subdivision that we're now moving, what those look like. So here's the area where the lots will be removed, lots 34 and 35, 41, 42, and 43. You can see where the road will be and the edge of the wetland. The wetland actually goes toward the road as well, as one of you noted, and that will be a part of the fill that we are having to uh, mitigate. But that gives you a sense of the demarcation the saved lands, uh, the saved wetlands, though, are all of the wetlands, or almost all of the wetlands, um, that are below the U and down to the Toth's fence down below. <clears throat> the development really should not have been such a surprise. The property is zoned residential. It's currently covered by a plan development approval since actually year 2000 is the one that approved this particular area. And that approved development is actually nearly identical to the proposal here. So this is um, my own ham-fisted work, but it is the plat, the six alt plat that we've been talking about today, as well as the year 2000 plat that was a part of the plan development approval in 2000. And you can see it's really hard to see how they're different. They're really not so different. The old plant lines are light red, and the proposal, the six alt, is black. And as you can see, they're simply almost indistinguishable. This land was always uh, planned to be residentially developed. So with regard to traffic standards, all traffic standards are also met. DKS has done three different studies in an effort to, uh, to look into the concerns that have been raised. All streets and intersections will operate within the code based capacity at 108 residences. Um, the supplemental studies that were conducted examine more intersections than was required to evaluate intersection delays to really see what would be going on out here when the property was developed. And the table that you saw staff present to you demonstrates that all intersections will perform at a level C or better, which is a standard that's required by the city's adopted code. Table four also shows the worst case scenario at page 262 of your current staff report, shows that the peak hour turn delays at most is less than a second, and at worst, the intersection increases to 4.4 seconds of a delay. The conclusion from the TIA is there's no evidence. Please, would you hold your comments in the audience? Thank you. There's no evidence that the additional traffic generated by the Oak Ridge Meadows development will degrade traffic operations and the estimated increase in delay for accessing Northwest Baker Creek Road are, for all intents and purposes, negligible, less than five seconds. That's the expert evidence in the record. Your planning commission, your staff report agreed with that. They've gone over it. I don't need to waste much time with that here, but the findings demonstrate that all city standards are met with regard to traffic volumes, capacity, and safety. You've also heard that there is really no need for Shadden to be any other than an emergency access and really no possibility of making it anything other than that. The fire department's concerns, which I understand, I wasn't around, but which I understand led to the previous lot limitation, 76 lot limitation uh, before Shadden uh, or before a second direct access from 
Pinehurst to Baker Creek Road was established have been resolved, um, as you've read in the staff report. There's really no reason, no code-based reason, to demand Shadden Road be used for construction access on capacity. The width of Pinot has uh, been an issue. Um, the staff report correctly outlines that uh, Pinot will be widened and that there's plenty of road right away to do that. Um, the wetlands, DSL, and core issues, um, the, the city doesn't have any standards. The con conditions require that all DSL and core requirements are met. The wetlands here that will be filled, as you can see, are isolated and of poor quality, and a majority of the wetlands will be preserved. The city really should not deviate from its established practices uh, for this particular residential proposal. Uh, the city defers to the regulatory authority uh, of DSL, and historically, as you saw, many housing developments have been built on partially mitigated wetlands. Um, and those projects include Oak Ridge and Crest Book Brooks First Edition. We'd urge some caution. I understand there's a lot of passion around this, uh, this argument and this, um, this development, but many of the opponents' state posing statements that you have heard show a lack of understanding and appreciation of the requirements and the limitations of this land use planning process. Um, an example is sort of there, there's th this casual comment and many others that says that you can just kind of revise your UGB, TSP, and other plans in order to divide deny this development proposal. And that's just not how it works. These are complex planning act actions and documents that require extensive work and uh, review processes to amend. So in all, we request that you approve these applications with the three conditions that uh, we recommended. Staff has uh, incorporated them at page three of their most recent staff supplement. We ask that you adopt the findings and conditions prepared by staff with the supplemental findings that we drafted. Uh, but better yet, given all of the issues in the record, we would ask that you make an oral approval decision with direction to staff, including the proposed commission conditions and that the findings and conditions come back to you on August 13th for your adoption. So we're sure to cover everything. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Yeah. Do we have others? Uh, yes, so we have We've got Steve about Ward. five minutes left. Yeah, okay. Good evening. Uh, my name is Steve Ward. I'm a principal engineer of West Tech Engineering, uh, located out of Salem. My, my address is on the sign-up sheet. First, I want to say staff did a pretty excellent job of explaining the floodplain issues. Uh, I'll be a little bit repetitive, but it's worth repeating. Um, staff and the Planning Commission correctly determined that the original proposal uh, met all city standards. Uh, your floodplain, none of this property was in the floodplain where the proposal was, where the lots were proposed. Uh, not in a floodplain map and there's no downstream impacts. Then questions arose about is the floodplain accurate or not. Uh, the, the opponents hired a consultant. Um, that consultant prepared a report. The report was very conservative. Uh, but in, in one spot in the report, it showed a decrease in the floodplain, and another spot it showed an increase, but again, the increase was one one-hundredth of a foot. Um, DLCDC staff confirmed that uh, PBS report did not use the FEMA methodology. Um, we've since, uh, Premier has since uh, immediately hired West Consultants who is using FEMA methodology. Uh, but we did determine as we as we went through that methodology that the five lots would be in a new mapped floodplain. And so that's the reason that we're proposing Exhibit 6A, and that's, that's the reason for that decision. Uh, West Consultants is really doing an extensive mapping in accordance with FEMA standards. Uh, we're doing actual surveying out there, taking the LIDAR information, extensive modeling. They're nearly complete with their work, um, but it's not done yet. That work will be given to the city as part of the as part of the process. Um, in, in a quick conclusion, and you heard it before, you heard it from staff. No developer or no engineer wants to put anyone in a floodplain. That's just not something we want to do. You know, so that's how we, how Exhibit Alternate Six that removes all the lots in question. They're just out of the floodplain. Um, it, it, and so it also protects some wetlands. It meets all city standards. Um, 
And, and what we will do when we're, at the end of the day, we'll certify that there's no rise, we'll certify there's no downstream impacts. And that's really the, the standard, the gold standard in this type of work. Okay, Lacey. Thank you. Again, uh, counselors, if you have questions when their time's up, then we could ask questions, okay? I'm Lacey Brown with DKS Associates. I'm a transportation engineer on this project. Um, I wanted to start by pointing out that the city did not require any traffic analysis as part of this application. This is an approved use um, and there's ample capacity in the study area. Um, all of the work that I did was voluntarily conducted by the applicant. Um, I wanted to, I know I heard some grumbles in the audience, the 4.4 seconds that was referenced in the proposal, um, I went out and did observations and I did analysis to look at what the net increase in delay would be for drivers trying to access Baker Creek Road after Oak Ridge Meadows is developed. Um, and so that was a net increase of less than five seconds um, based on all of our observations and standard practice of traffic engineering. Um, the last thing I wanted to point out was um, standard practice and the city guidelines require us to use trip generation estimates that are developed by the Institute of Transportation Engineers. Um, these are estimates in, in the name. Um, and I did some quick runs of numbers as I know we're getting close to that 1200 vehicle threshold. The existing developments that are out there that are on Oak Creek, Oak Ridge Drive and Merlot Drive are actually generating less traffic per household than what ITE estimates um, and what the numbers were used in our report. So it is likely that a full build out of Oak Ridge Meadows, um, we wouldn't even reach that 1200 vehicle per day threshold. Okay, Caroline. We have about 42 seconds. Talk fast. <laughs> <laughs> Caroline Rimmer with Pacific Habitat Services. We conducted the wetland delineation for the entire site. So um, I know at one point there was some question about whether or not the entire project area was looked at for <coughs> wetland delineation. And we made several trips out there. We started off originally with four trips out there and then we added another one recently so that we could add the um, northern portion of tax lot 602. So the entire site has now been delineated and um, a delineation report has been put together and all this information. Okay, our 20 minutes are up. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Or our, our, our 20 minutes are up. So at this point, does any counselors have any questions of the applicant or the support staff of the applicant? Adam? Uh, this is a question, I guess, probably for Lacey. Uh, in your trip count, you deviated traffic after it comes off uh, Pino onto Oak Ridge and uh, Merlot at a 70-30 split. And I was just wondering if that's like standard practice or if that's in the McMinnville code or how you arrived at. Yeah, so that's it's not in the code. Um, it's based on typical driver behavior that people want to turn on to the earliest street that they can, um, but that people also know the neighborhood, and so they also will take the shortest route um, based on their perception of the route. So um, typically when there's two access points, um, the 70-30 split is, is a typically observed split for drivers accessing um, the same development via two different access points. So it was more on engineering judgment and practice as opposed to a city requirement. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Um, I Remy? Have, I have one um, for uh, Caroline, was it? Pacific Habitat? Sorry. Just um, Could you um, expand a little bit on the um, PBS engineering rebuttal? Um, and which I understand is not your company, but um, in the sense that um, though the conclusions of, uh, of that report um, and the hydraulic analysis um, were that the proposed development would not increase downstream flooding, but also that the uh, currently effective FEMA study does not accurately depict the floodplain, sorry. 
<laughs> wrong Caroline. Wrong, wrong person. <laughs> I apologize. <I'm laughs> uh, would you repeat the question, please? Uh, I, I was just hoping for an expansion on the conclusion of the rebuttal um, testimony that um, in, the, in, in the rebuttal, part of the conclusion is that the currently effective FEMA study does not accurately depict the floodplain. And so I'm just trying to um, kind of wrap my mind around uh, the delineations there um, between saying that we have a comprehensive study um, and, and we thoroughly understand the wetland situation, however, we don't thoroughly understand and, and we're acknowledging that we don't accurately understand the floodplain situation and then simultaneously saying the floodplain situation has been addressed through the removal of um, these properties. So, and I know there's a lot of moving pieces, so if I didn't say that exactly correctly, please forgive me, but what I'm asking for is how you can, um, if you can bring those uh, essentially two kind of three pieces of information together for me. One saying that, uh, again, I'll try to say it a little bit more clearly, that um, that in, in the engineering rebuttal, um, there's an acknowledgement that the FEMA study does not accurately depict the floodplain, and then the um, uh, and then the conditions for approval are addressing um, concerns regarding both the, the wetlands and the floodplain. But there, um, the part that there, there's a disconnect for me is saying we don't understand the floodplain but here we've addressed the concerns because we do understand it. So if you could expand on that a little. Okay, I'll do my best to answer okay, your, sorry. your sorry. multiple questions, I believe. So first of all, you understand that your adopted floodplain maps that were fully in compliance with the adopted floodplain maps and we're not filling any, we're not having any lots in any floodplains under your, under your current adopted floodplain maps. You understand that? I understand that from the March 2nd, 2010 maps, but also that there's an acknowledgement that those right. floodplain maps are most likely inaccurate, which we, we read can, repeatedly. So, so at some point in time, uh, it became, um, it came to Premier's attention that the, that the floodplain maps may not be accurate. So they retained West Consultants and West Tech to do a comprehensive study, okay? And we started that study with West Consultants, uh, which, which means we're gathering a lot of data, processing through FEMA requirements. And, and through that study, um, you know, we still believe through that study that even the original plan doesn't have any impacts. The original plan, before we remove the five lots, we still believe there's no rise and no impacts. But this is such a lightning rod of an issue that we felt like if we removed those five lots out of the potential floodplain, that that just kind of solves and makes the problem go away. And that's, we made that decision, Premier made that decision to just kind of make that problem go away. Honestly, the the work that's been done to date, those lots wouldn't have to go away, and we believe we could still meet a no rise and a no impact downstream. It was just a method. It was just a means to to help facilitate the approval. Other questions? Did you get your question answered? So, if I can try to rephrase it, because I. It, is a, is a concern that if we don't really know where the floodplains are, how do we know that moving the lots where we're planning on moving them won't keep them in the floodplain or something I, like that? that would be I can answer that question. Okay. I can answer that question very simply. <laughs> we are going to certify to the city that there's no rise and no impacts downstream. So we will give the city a study that says, here's the 100-year floodplain and here's the impacts <laughs> at the property, at the vicinity of the property and no impacts downstream based upon FEMA standards. So we'll, there'll be a study provided to the city, and that's part of the conditions of approval. If you look at the revised conditions that staff shared earlier. Right, but that, aren't those sites, I, I mean, I could have misread this or mixed up the information by now, no doubt, but aren't those sites specific? No. No? no, we are we are site. studying. We we say I, I think the condition says in the immediate vicinity, Baker Creek in the immediate vicinity of the of the development and immediately downstream. And so, what happens with these studies is, is they they calibrate these models, 
and you, and you're you're just in a reach. You're in a reach of the of the stream, and you just want to make sure that when you're, and we've done a lot of these. When you're at the upper end, you need to match what the flood study's doing, and when you're at the uh, at the downstream end, you need to match what the flood study's doing. And and most of the time, it's when we're we're filling. But I, I need you to understand, we're not filling the floodplain here. There's very very. I, in fact, I don't think there's any fill when we remove those five lots. And so, so that's why we're super confident that there's no rise and no impact downstream because the five lots take all the fill away. There is, and I want to make that a little clarification. There's a little bit of fill where the streets are, but it's very minimal. In a follow up on that, the, the location where you're proposing to move those five lots, has there been any argument um, or evidence presented by anybody that the floodplain extends to that area? None whatsoever. Okay. So then that gives you confidence that where you're proposing to move them to is not, right. that, that's not an area that's impacted by anybody's claim of where the floodplain is? Correct. Okay. Zach? I, I have, have a question, but maybe it's a concern with the statement, and so I'll air it and someone can help me work through it maybe. Uh, so it, you brought it up on the conditions that you offered that you, and I appreciate your confidence, will provide us a report that says it's out of the floodplain and all good. It, I have concern with being provided a report that says that versus commissioning a study, and hopefully it says this, versus whatever results come about. I, I don't know, it might just be a verbiage thing that I'm having trouble with, but it seems an odd way to write that. So, you know, if they get commission a study and provide that to us, or where is the assumption? There's a com study commissioned with the intent of that, and regardless of the results, that's turned in and we deal with it based on those results, or? So if I understand the question correctly, <laughs> There's concern about the report we will receive in terms of certifying that it's accurate. Is that, is that it? Mm, I guess that's a theme of my question or because, concern, but it's more like... What if we get results that are unexpected, perhaps? Or what if they get results that are unexpected? Are, we, are those shared with us? Or is, is, are the results of the study shared with us regardless of the outcomes? So if, so if the results, if, if the concern, so the concern isn't the quality of the report. The concern would be what if there are uh, unknown results of lots that are in an expanded floodplain that aren't being discussed this evening? Is that a discussion? Is that the concern? I don't know if I understand that statement. I'm worried my intent is getting taken away. So just, just so you understand, in terms of our process, just like we do for, for all expert testimony that comes in in terms of expert reports, we review them. Um, in this particular instance, because there is, there is the um, DLCD has staffed to, that they provide to jurisdictions to help them review these types of reports and affirm them, we would then send the report that we receive from the applicant to the DLCD staff to have them to review it and affirm it back to us. So that's how you're going to quality assure, quality check yeah. the report. Right. What is the what is the scenario in which the study that they commissioned doesn't yield the results that they are confident in? Well, the, are, are those shared with us? Are they still to be shared with? Yes. May I answer that question? Because I certainly can answer it. Sure. The study is nearly done right now. That's why we are so confident. But the study is not 100% completed. But it's far enough along that our team knows we know that we are not going to be impacting the floodplain. So we're not worried about some situation out there that's going to change this. We're going to provide the data and give that to the city to show them that there's no impacts on the floodplain because our work is nearly done. Did that answer that for you, Zach? Sort of. Okay. So they elect to share the results with us. No, it's a condition of approval. It's a condition of approval, so. So, so the language in the condition is, and it's in the memo that we uh -huh. provided to you, the language in the condition is that they would provide us a professionally engineered and certified report to FEMA standards. And what it has to show is that there's no rise. Certi so they have to provide a certified report that there's no rise. That's the downstream flooding issue. And also identify where the potential new floodplain could be. Okay. They have done the most of the work for the floodplain analysis that I understand and feel that there is no lots impacted past what has been de dialogued this evening and that the analysis is actually more conservative and it will may shrink as they continue to refine it. 
Okay. Which is the same thing we heard from the FEMA review. And if and they I, were unable guess, to do that, they would fail to meet the condition of approval. Right. right. <laughs> and also the, the other kind of sensitivity check on that is that these, these lots that we're talking about are the ones that the PBS study also shows would be impacted. And so I think the engineers would say that the PBS study, uh, because of its methodology, is far, far, far more conservative. So if there's a worst case, that's what it is. And those lots are being removed from even the PBS a uh, very conservative floodplain. And so between that as a sensitivity check and our own study, which has been, you know, site specifically surveyed on the ground to see what the elevations actually are and the flood storage capacity is and all that stuff, that those, uh, that there is just, just isn't a problem and that they're very confident that this certification is gonna, and the study is going to provide you with the comfort that we think that you would like to have and also to provide the developer with assurance that the development is not going to cause problems. Yeah, and if I may, I'll just read the, the language in, in the condition. Um, so further, further relative to the floodplain, um, that this professionally engineered and certified hydrologic and hydraulic evaluation, that's a two-part test, of Baker Creek in the immediate vicinity of the subject property that complies with FEMA standards for a detailed flood study to ensure that the proposed lots as depicted in the application site plan exhibit 6A Will not be subject to flooding during the 1% annual chance 100 year floodplain, 100 year flood. So they have to show, they have to provide us a report to show that the proposed lots will not be in the in a potential expanded floodplain. Is that what you're trying to get at? Yes. Thank you, Zach. I have a follow up on something else. Go ahead, you so just Remy. And I'm, I'm sorry, Car Carl? Steve. Steve, jeez. So I'm so sorry. That's <laughs> way off. It's okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, sorry, I apologize um, for that. Uh, so in it, something you just said um, uh, a few minutes ago, you said there has been no fill. Um, and um, while this ha hadn't really um, come up in the presentation, we did receive in um, this from the uh, opposing party, and I assume you've all had a chance to see this as well as part of the public record, um, that there is... Um, something in here um, that's marked out, photographed, and, and says that there is this already existing island of, uh, and I'm reading this, so this, is, um, this is not a statement coming from me, this is what the statement coming um, uh, uh, from this booklet. Um, so it says there is an island of unpermitted fill from 2005, um, and that Google Earth clearly shows that berm did not exist in 2004, but roads and fill came in 2005 under the ownership of Premier. Uh, it goes on to say we can find no record of permit for this fill in an area of probable wetlands at the time. So I'm asking that only be because you just said there has been no fill at this point, and so I'm wondering if you can address that. Yeah, well, let me clarify that. What I what I think I said was that the fill that's required is no longer needed because we're moving the lots and that there is a minor amount of fill for the streets. I was not talking about any past fills. I'm not aware of that. So what I'm talking about is with this new development, there's no need for fill anymore when we remove those five lots because they are in the PBS report showing to be in the floodplain and they'd have to be, fill be filled to come out of the floodplain. So I'm not talking about any past fills that may have occurred. I'm talking about future fills that are required for the development. Okay, since, since it's kind of uh, come up organically now, is there is is there anybody that can address this past? Um, it, I, I, I can, fill? and there are probably other other people, um, Councilor Draven. The uh, the 2005 development that occurred occurred under, you know, DSL and core permits. And I know that there is some um, op opponent uh, concerns about all of that. I'm not really sure I understand what those are. But the one thing I do know is that with regard to this approval, that there is no approval standard that that issue bears on. And so I, I, I'm not really sure where to go with that. So there, 
probably our other people know more about those uh, 2005 core and DSL permits. We can talk about those, but. So Remy, <laughs> is it your position they're not relevant to the criteria that are before the, yeah, I mean, the I, council I tonight? Is yeah. that what you're saying? I mean, yeah. We had them, we had those permits. There was fill that was approved as a part of the 2005 approval um, to create the, the, the subdivision that you, that you see. And um, I don't see how that relates to an approval standard. Okay. Uh, one question I have, and again, this may be a hard one, but Lori, do you have a, a time frame of approximate buildup out of the 108 uh, lots. I know that's a part of market and selling, but in, in your mind, do you have a, a, a thought process how many years that may take to build out? You have to come up here, I think. I know it's hard for you, but I think you or, can we extend the microphone? microphone to her. Oh, will it, will it go <laughs> or move a chair? Probably not. We got a little limit there, yeah. Almost there. <laughs> I'm sorry, but just okay. stupid Mount Bachelor. Yeah, <laughs> rough on me. Um, well, I think first of all, the we have a condition of approval that phase one will be recorded once all the approvals are okayed um, at a two-year mark, and then after that. The, the next phase, phase two, would be recorded prior to the three-year mark. So the building of the land will definitely be done by five years from the approval. Um, I'm guessing with the market and, you know, it may take more years than that. I don't sure. know. Sure, sure. Thank you. Okay, I'm looking. Any other questions, Remy? Um, not at this moment. Okay. okay. Wendy? Um, I actually have a question for the wetland specialist. Caroline? Thank you. It was it Caroline? Caroline, yes. Um, okay, thank you. Um, I, there was a reference made to um, the type of wetlands that that 0 0.9 uh, is that and and the um, Heather had mentioned that part of the DSL evaluation is to to evaluate the grade of wetlands and how important it might be and how it's mitigated and all that stuff. Can right. you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So um, the wetlands out there, specifically what you're talking about, the 0.9 acre, they're not. Um, they're pretty typical wetlands, but they're relatively low quality in the sense that they um, consist of a monoculture of invasive um, species such as reed canary grass. Mm -hmm. It's not a forested wetland. It's not a shrub, scrub shrub wetland. So um, that kind of addresses the quality. And as far as mitigation, so any of those wetlands that are gonna be impacted, there's no room to mitigate on site. Mm -hmm. So the only option for this particular project is to do offsite mitigation, and that is to go to a mitigation bank. Mm -hmm. And so what, what that means is there's land set aside, um, and these are mitigation banks that service particular areas. And you don't wanna lose um, <laughs> functional value of a wetland when you impact it. So mm -hmm. for compensatory mitigation, you create the same type of wetland at mm -hmm. the mitigation bank. So mm -hmm. you buy credits mm -hmm. at a one-to-one -one ratio, you buy the credits and that money goes towards um, creating that type of wetland to compensate for what you've impacted. And would it be in the same in the same watershed? Yeah, okay. yeah. And that's why they have specific <coughs> service areas that DSL um, and the Corps have worked together to establish. Mm -hmm. So you can't just um, impact something here and just choose any mitigation bank. You have to stay within your service area if there is one. Okay. What's the size of this service area? Oh, I, I'm not sure exactly what the size. I mean, it's pretty extensive. Um, but there is a boundary, and you can look at, at a map that shows that this particular um, site for this project is within the service area for the mud slough mitigation bank. And so that's where we would be going to um, purchase credits. And so, um, and this is, it, 
if a mitigation fails, mm -hmm. what then happens? You might not know, but like... So that's exactly what happened on this site. Yeah. They received their permits back like 15 years ago mm -hmm. plus. Mm -hmm. Um, they mitigated on site mm -hmm. and that mitigation failed. Mm -hmm. So they tried to repair that by excavating, replanting, and they did that a couple times and it still didn't work. So there's mm -hmm. no point in trying to mitigate here again mm -hmm. because it's, it's likely it's gonna fail. Mm -hmm. So that's why we opted to go to a mitigation bank. Gotcha, so the failure was, the mitigation that failed was on the site and that means it didn't become a wetlands even though it tried to, you tried to that's prepare right. it. That's right, it was lacking wetlands. either plants, hydrology, or wetland, um, wetland soils developing because mm -hmm. okay. it was created out of an upland area. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so the, the alternative to that is going to the bank, which That's is right. what, yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, if there was space available, but there just isn't. There's nothing appropriate on site. Okay, great. Thank you so much. That answers my question. You're welcome. Okay, I'll ask once again, any questions of the applicant or uh, the specialist. Okay, hearing none, thank you so very much. Um, we now are to that point where we will hear from those, well, l let me ask if there's anyone that would like to, to speak in support of this uh, proposal. <coughs> Seeing none, then we will, and uh, now we're to the point where we will uh, invite members of the audience that which, which, which uh, wish to speak in opposition of this proposal. Now, if you speak, we remind you that your testimony is limited to three minutes. Provide the land use application that you are testifying about and the comprehensive plan criteria or the McMinnville City Code criteria that you feel that the project does not meet, why it does not meet the criteria and why you feel that the condition of approval will not help it meet the criteria. If you have a proposed condition of approval to help the project meet the criteria, please provide that as well. Again, we will give you five, uh, three minutes to testify, and then we will ask if any member of the council has questions uh, of you uh, from that point. So we'll start with, um, and I'm not going to do this right, but Ali Sothana. Thank you, Allie. Again, I will give you a five minute war a five second warning and then. Very good, thank you. Welcome. My and name is Ali Sultani. Uh, I'm a property owner in the Compton Crest uh, subdivision, uh, which was on the maps here. Sure. Uh, the discussion a that- closer, uh, Just a little bit closer. Just hello, is this better? There we go. Hey. Uh, the discussion that Councilman Gary brought up on uh, the issue of the study or the certificate actually changes uh, uh, what, what I was going to present here, I'm not neither in support nor in op opposition of the project, but rather had some comments on the process. Uh, if that's still allowable, I will proceed. Otherwise, I'll go back. Okay, go so it appears that there's some still uh, arguments, technical arguments, both on studies regarding the floods, uh, the wetlands perhaps. Uh, I heard, this is my first time I'm attending these sessions here. I heard the arguments here presented by the applicant. Uh, I, I heard the references to uh, technical studies by the opponents, uh, but that apparently they're being uh, uh, challenged here by the applicant. So if the council is going to try to reconcile the technical merits of these arguments, uh, what I'd like to propose is that these studies, to be studies, uh, even if they will be funded by the applicants, be reported to the council, including the interim and the draft studies. And then the council can choose to have periodic updates for all parties, and that will really be in the benefit of all parties, as well as it will ensure the integrity of the study and avoid controversy at the end when the final product is delivered. Well put, thank you. Thank you. And I'll just ask of, of Heather, that's the intent, is that we will get the full study and it, then we we will make that available to council and anyone that, that would be interested? 
Uh, so, well, typically when we have development review of studies that are required as conditions of approval, they're, they're, re they're reviewed under our development process and not through a public process okay. because they are empirical, they're not discretionary. Um, if there was an interest in doing a work session or something like that, I'm going to defer to David as to that requirement and process. It's not a typical process right now. Okay, right. I'm not sure that I understood the question that you were referring to. So is it, um, if, so we received the report from the applicant, the, we have the, we have the report from the opponent in terms of the hydrologic analysis, that's a public record. And we received the report from the applicant, that will be public record as well. But my understanding is having some sort of public process of review, um, it, that's not currently in our process of development review after we receive the after we receive engineering reports that are required as conditions of approval. Yeah. Okay, I guess the question that I had is once we get the the uh, final report that fits the FEMA standards, would they be notified of our findings uh, as we make possibly that request to move forward with updating our maps? They being FEMA? Yes. So that's that's an entirely different discussion. That's a policy discussion. So okay. if the city wants to move forward with updating its FEMA maps and um, and having that dialogue and analysis, that's policy level. And yes, that, that would be a direction from you as city council. Okay. And that, that would all be conducted in a public process. Okay. If it's a review of this particular report relative to this development proposal, that's a different process. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. As Steve Fox. Thank you, Steve. Good evening. Um, Steve Fox. I live at the corner of Oak Ridge and Pinot Noir. Um, thank you for allowing me to be part of the, this process. Thank you for all the time you guys put into this and you and all your consultants. Um, I'd like to talk about traffic. KPFF is a great company. I don't dispute any of their work, but I happen to live at the corner where all these cars are going to be going by. And last um, city council meeting, policy uh, 78 was brought up, and I'd like to address that as a potential way that we could mitigate some of the traffic that would be rumbling by my, by my house um, on a daily basis. The current plan is to construct this project with one access in and out up Pinot Noir, right by my, my address. And this seems so unnecessary to me because Shadden Road is already planned. Shadden Road is already planned to um, handle the weight and the size of huge fire trucks. And I don't see why it couldn't be developed in a way where it could handle all the construction traffic, all of the people looking to go by those homes, all the people moving into those homes, and potentially all the people living there, as well as the rest of the community potentially wanting to visit the neighborhood park. <coughs> Policy 78 in the MAC comprehensive plan reads, traffic systems within planned developments shall be designed to be compatible with the circulation patterns of adjoining properties. How can increasing traffic by six-fold be compatible with the circulation of adjacent properties? My understanding is that the roads were designed to accommodate this volume of traffic, but this doesn't take away from the change to our daily experience. I did a little looking today on FHWA's website, and they say that about 25% of all trips are commutes for work. Uh, add to school traffic and other things happening in the morning, it's not hard to imagine that potentially half of those 1,000 trips might be initiated during the morning commute time. So I want to ask you, city council members, picture yourself tomorrow morning trying to back out of your driveway, and all of a sudden you find that you have 250 to 500 more cars going by your driveway during that time you're trying to get out on an average day. Is that not changing the circulation pattern, the texture of the neighborhood per the policy in your own plan? My understanding is that previous developments in McMinnville have increased traffic in other neighborhoods, but I wonder about two things. One, what has been the historical increase in traffic? I think that was brought up earlier. Has it been sixfold? What has been the threshold? The other one, has any other neighborhood had only one way in and one way out for the new development? 
My request to the city council is to consider what threshold is acceptable for the increase of traffic within the limits of policy 78. Would doubling be acceptable? Would tripling be acceptable? Would quadrupling be acceptable? Would five times still be acceptable? There must be a threshold of an impact to the adjacent property per the policy in your plan. My hope is that you will determine. We've, we've hit our three minutes. Oh, okay. any, any questions for Steve from council? Uh, can I ask a question of staff related to Go ahead. The testimony? Um, so in the June 25th meeting, this also came up, um, Jamie, I think you answered it at that time, um, about the um, any other developments with one access point, and you did name some other developments with one access point. Did they have that singular access point? So it's a two-part question. Did they have that singular access point during the time of construction? Um, is part one and part two, do you know the uh, chronology of that development? So um, similarly, were there, um, were there residences at the front end that um, were being um, passed by regularly as the back end of the development was happening? Uh, yes, uh, so I believe that the, the development that you refer to is the Michael Book 4th edition, which is just across Baker Creek Road from Oak Ridge Drive. Uh, Doral Drive, I believe, Doral Drive, uh, is the only access point in or out of that, uh, that subdivision. <clears throat> um, and it remains that way. Um, there's no other access point in or out of that subdivision. Uh, as to the timing of that and the phasing of that development, I'm not sure um, what um, what that entailed. But there there remains one access point in and out of that particular subdivision. Thank okay. You. Uh, I don't Any other questions of Steve? Go ahead, Adam. Just to follow up on Remy's, uh, Jamie, do you know how many lots are in that subdivision, Michael Book Fourth Edition? And comparable to like. Average daily trips. I, I I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. Um, I believe. <laughs> Maybe Mike knows. It, it certainly would take me some time to do a chronological analysis for you, but if you can imagine um, how we've developed as a community over time, you develop incrementally and the pieces of the puzzle keep getting added at the edges. And so at times, there, it, the house that this gentleman's living in, all of the traffic that was going to construct that subdivision in his house went through the subdivisions that's closer to Baker Creek Road. And so over time, we build out. We don't build the farthest piece first and then build all the connections to town mm -hmm. from that point. And so historically, that's how the city has developed. And there have certainly been multiple occasions where there were one road in and out until the neighboring properties were built and connected. So the key is, to, is the traffic threshold being met that's within our transportation system plan? And the evidence in the record indicates that the street network will handle the proposed traffic from the proposed development. Okay. Other questions? Hearing none, thank you, Steve. Next, Mike Colvin. Mike. Welcome. We only have one slide. I won't bother you. Okay. <laughs> we'll give you a minute to get that up when we start the time. I'm sorry, can I get your name as well? Just so I pull your card out. Okay. Yeah. Are you testifying as well? No, I'm not. Okay. I'm just going to move the slide for him. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. I, I, I just want to make sure I pulled your card. If, so that <laughs> I didn't call you. To push a button. Um, hi, my name is Mike Colvin. Uh, I live at 2718 Northwest Pinot Noir. We appreciate the City Council giving us the opportunity to present our recommendations. We included most of those in the notebooks we handed in, so I only have a few comments tonight. The first is we know that the city is under a lot of pressure to increase density and the number of affordable houses in town. 
That is why other than the access issue, we haven't questioned one thing about the upper 24 acres um, in the Oak Ridge Meadows where probably 80, 90% of the residents are to be located. But you folks are also responsible to keeping McMinnville citizens safe and protecting the city from zillion dollar lawsuits. That is why we tried so hard to show that the allowing development on the 4722 property and off of Cros Crestbrook down the road, <clears throat> excuse me, will likely lead to small scale version of Johnson Creek in Portland, where the long-term restoration liability costs could cost far more be far more expensive than any short-term economic gains. Before you approve any development on 4722 or attach that to any other property, please require Premier to get all of the DEQ, uh, DSL, Army Corps of Engineers permits that Doug Montgomery requested 14 years ago. And in our looking, it doesn't look like one request has been done, I guess. That leaves me with one last request. The comprehensive plan demands two access roads for every new development. I'm still struggling to believe that the Planning Commission voted to leave the approximately 250 people in the main section of Oak Ridge Meadows and the 1,000 vehicle trips per day they generate with only one access road for up to 10 years. And worse yet, the one access road goes through Compton Crest and Oak Ridge neighborhoods, so the commission's approval of only one access will really end up penalizing over 500 residents in three neighborhoods for up to 10 years. Um, please don't let that happen. <laughs> yeah, I just can't imagine. Uh, if you read Premier's own Exhibit 27, it makes clear that Stafford Development is willing to make Shad Street available in Phase 1 of Oak Ridge Meadows. We also went to two neighborhood meetings where their representative said that. So we don't think it is right for the city to give Premier an option of not providing that second access street just because they are not willing to bear the cost of developing a few hundred yards of gravel road. For that reason, we're asking the city council to require Premier to follow McMinnville's comprehensive plan and provide Oak Ridge Meadows residents with a, both Pinot Noir and Shadden as access streets in phase one of the development. Um, we realize that there has uh, been a, a lawsuit where they can't, you can't force them to build on someone else's property. That is fine. Please just require Premier to provide two access streets in their phase one. Three, three minutes, Mike. Thank you. Any questions for Mike from councilors? Mike, did you have any else, anything else you wanted to finish before you uh, head out? <laughs> Excuse me? I said, did you have anything else you wanted to finish before you head out? Anything. I just wanted that phase one road and that would do it for me. Uh, the environmental stuff we've left. I think DSL and those should uh, handle the environmental issues, but the access is unbelievable to me. Thank you. Can I ask Thank a you. question of city staff? Go ahead. Um, so we've, uh, or I feel as though I've heard conflicting um, reports tonight, so specific question for staff um, in regards to permits um, that are required by uh, DEQ and Army Corps of Engineers. So we've heard conflicting information. Can you can you clarify um, the uh, whether or not permits ha have been granted or what the t appropriate timeline for those permits would be? So typically at the city of McMinnville, we require that the, that their, the permits are acquired before development occurs. However, it's a condition of approval of the land use decision. So the land use decision is made. The condition of approval is that permits need to be required acquired before the development occurs. So the land use decision is made, the applicant then goes out and gets the permits, brings them back to us. We go through the re engineering review for the infrastructure. The, the engineers are reviewing the permits to see if they've been acquired appropriately. And then uh, we approve moving forward with the infrastructure build out. So the permits have to be acquired before any development takes place whatsoever. Yeah, depending correct? on the regulation. So the, the, there are many different agencies that are regulating different types of um, activities and so well whether it's relative to the infrastructure builder or not there's a there's a sequence in terms of the permits that are required the condition of approval is the development needs to 
um, adhere and meet all federal, state, and local rec regulations. So there's a, there's a, that's a standard condition of approval that's in every city of McMinnville land use decision. In this particular case, because there's been so many different um, issues that have been raised that are sort of independent underneath that, we have actually written some conditions of approval that are specific to receiving permits from DSL for the Whitlands, receiving the permits from here for that, so that it's, so that it's clear that these permits will be achieved before any development moves forward that, that needs those permits to move forward. And then my um, second question is for you, Mike. Um, so when I asked um, Lori earlier about um, the use of Shadden Road, she said that specifically had spoken with Gordon Roots at Stafford and they had denied access. And you said you were in two neighborhood meetings in which they had um, said that they would give access. Um, do you know who the representative was at those meetings by any chance? Was it also... Um, Gordon Roots, or or can you elaborate on what was told to you at those neighborhood meetings? I forget the man's name. Uh, he's probably a 40-year-old. I think he was an engineer, and he attended both the um, um, Oak Ridge Meadows neighborhood meeting that we went to, and then just several months ago, he was at the Baker Creek um, North meeting. It was the same guy. And both times when he was asked the question, he kind of perked up like he wanted to hear it because I think they would like Premier to provide that 300 yards of road. Um, and they answered, yes, we would be willing to do that. So my recommendation is somebody from the city should maybe talk to them. In the past, that would have <laughs> been acceptable. I don't know with all the rules, but um, boy, if they're willing to do that, you can save given a lot of grief to three neighborhoods of people, especially the Oak Ridge Meadows people who could go directly out. And Shadden's a far superior access. They can go across Shadden. They can go out to Meadows. They can go out Baker Creek Road eventually. Okay, and, and then I'm gonna just de defer back to city staff for a second here. So you talked about the phased development um, that has come in since this has all been in process and specifically related to Shadden Road. Um, so uh, they're not planning on doing a full, on fully building out that road for the next five to 10 years. Um, uh, does, is there, have, have they, uh, let me think how to phrase this best. Um, so they're not planning on building that road fully for five to 10 years, but they are um, allowing this gravel access road at this time. Uh, so have they indicated to the planning department in any way whether or not they would allow a gravel road, uh, the, the, any additional, sorry, um, any additional length of gravel road to exist at this time if they were not um, financially responsible for it or has that conversation not so happened? The, the, the f if I understand correctly, the full length of Shadden Road to serve the northern side of the Oak Ridge Meadows development, there is an access easement and an agreement to allow the gravel road for the secondary emergency access. So that full access is already allowed and that gravel road is allowed. That's, that's the email you've see, you saw in the record indicates that um, and that they, the, staff, um, the developer is going to have to provide that as part mm -hmm. of our condition of approval. The discussion of the full build out of the public street is a very different discussion. That's, and, and I'm not approaching that right now in I, my question. But I think that's the request. So to allow it to open up for the public and for public vehicles to use it, it would have to be a full build out of the public street. We did have a meeting with uh, Stafford Land Company when their application came in and we asked them that question after the, we, we've been asking them as we go, we try to coordinate developments and developers as we're going through the process. Again, we can only require X, Y, and Z, but we try to encourage A, B, and C over here. Um, but those are discussions that take place between the developers. We did meet with Stafford recently <clears throat> because their application's incomplete, so there's some things they need to provide to us. We had that meeting. At the end of the meeting, we did ask them, and this was after the planning commission meeting, 
have you con would you consider allowing this to be a full street build out if the premier was willing to build it and at that time they told us they wouldn't and the reason for that is there's a lot of infrastructure that's built in the ground underneath the street that serves the different lots that front the street. And so if they're, they don't have that pre-planned until they get into that phase of residential development. And that is the last <coughs> phase of their residential development is that northern side of, of Shadden Drive. And so if it's not fully built out, it can be used for emergency vehicles, it can't be used uh, generally by the public could would there could there be in any circumstance any other allowable access say construction vehicles uh, i'm going to defer to mike on that one <laughs> for the standards i'm not aware of any city uh, standard that would require uh, construction vehicles to go on someone else's property so Certainly that wouldn't prevent two property owners from entering into such an agreement, but I'm not aware of any city standard that would require us to impose that as a condition. No, and that I understand, but if you turn it around, is there anything, any, is there any reason that it would limit um, the use of that road by vehicles other than emergency vehicles? Well, certainly if the easement that was granted by Stafford to Premier was for emergency vehicle access, it would require a modification to that easement to allow any other type of access. Okay. And that's an agreement between the two property owners. Okay. I have a follow-up question. Um, the, there was an indication that there's a requirement for two access points, and we had heard earlier that that is not the case. There's only a requirement that there is an two for emergency purposes, but not to public access points. Correct. Is that correct? So I'm not familiar with the comp plan policy that, that Mike is referencing. Um, if if you have it, I can look it up right now. Uh, I was just visiting with Mike. If he Mike Fissett, if he was familiar with it, he's not familiar with it either. <coughs> okay. Okay, hearing it. I read it somewhere. <laughs> I read a lot in the last couple of months. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine that. Okay, any further questions? Thank you, Mike and Sandy. So I just wanted to clarify, Heather, that, that you said that you did not find the requirement for the two, or Mike, the two points of access in our transportation plan. You're not aware of that as a policy. Okay. Thank you, Sal. Uh, Kathy Gokler. Welcome, Kathy. Thank you for giving. Oh, here. Pull the mic down. Yeah. Yes. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Thank you for giving us this opportunity. Um, from my point of view, this whole problem contentious thing could have been avoided. In the city's memorandum dated 12-8-2003, states that premier development would be advised to first obtain concurrence from DSL, given the possibility that DSL might not approve subsequent actions necessary to permit this area's use for residential housing. When I spoke with DSL, they said builders often get this backwards. They need to come to us first before they come to the city because their limits are different than city limits and they sometimes say no to what a city can and will approve. And I feel that if this had been a requirement, this whole process wouldn't have gotten this far along. Um, I'm sorry, I've lost my place here. Uh, um, the, well, I'm sorry. 
Um, neighbors from three adjoining HOAs uh, agree that there's a problem with this development. The Friends of Baker Creek have concerns and so does the Yamhill Soil and Water Conservation District. I don't think they're concerned about the view. So do many others who have testified. Uh, tonight, we're asking you to vote no on 4722. Please keep in mind that this is a piece of development that was began years ago, and a promise was made for a five-year build-out. Things happen, but tonight you're also being promised five years, and you're looking at a street that is going to be handling a bundle of cars for longer than five years, if it builds out according to um, all the best laid plans. We're voting you to vote no on Pinehurst. Um, we're asking you to change the city policy so that before any application is deemed complete, appropriate DSL, Army Corps, and DEQ permits are in place for the simple reason that it will save the taxpayers and city thousands of tax dollars, as evidenced by those binders, um, defending proposals that may be rejected out of hand by one or more of those agencies. We're asking you to vote to update the FEMA map so the city makes informed decisions. We're asking you not to turn a 0.85 acre park into an attractive nuisance Kathy. in perpetuity. Okay. Three minutes. Any questions for Kathy from any counselors? It's not for Kathy, but I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm going to ask staff again, just because we keep getting this conflicting information. And so, um, uh, Kathy just stated that the initial condition of approval, which I've read, but I don't know where to find it right now, um, uh, said that the DSL permits had to come first. And then in my question on, uh, with the last testimony, um, I know you just said this, but I just feel like there's still some confusion in the room about it. So um, the DSL permits do not have to come first. So in the city of McMinnville, the practice has been that the DSL permits come after the land use decision. That's been a historical practice. And you need to understand, remember, these, these are approved plan developments. So these, were, these have already been approved, 2000, 2005. They have conditions on them. Those conditions exist at that level as well. So we, we are moving forward conditions from those previous land use decisions into the amended land use decision as well. Thank you. Just to follow, Heather, do you think there might be some confusion here about the different types of city approvals that might be involved? So we've got a land use approval process. We have building permit approvals, um, which come after perhaps the DSL permits are, are received, um, and that perhaps it's a confusion about what point in the process somebody finds themselves. I don't want to surmise what a person's confusion or, or, or not. It's a very complicated process. There's a lot of nuances. There's a lot of regulations. There's local regulations. There's state regulations. And there's different milestones in every step of the process. And I think that um, we, we have been working and in conversation with um, the Friends of Baker Creek for many months now trying to help them understand the process and the the different milestones that we work through but it's it's tough it's a tough industry to learn as as a neighbor who's who you know is um has concerns about a development that's going up next to them and to and to participate at a level of, of the complexity and read all the documents and things like that so Currently, we, we can ch if, it's a, if it's a policy decision to change here at the city of McMinnville, how we conduct our process and the permits that we receive before we make decisions or don't make decisions, again, that's a policy discussion. Yeah. Any further questions at this time? Thank you, Kathy. Appreciate it. Scott Wellman. Mm -hmm. Welcome, Scott. Hello, Scott. Yes. 
Nice to be here. <clears throat> I did not live in McMinnville in 1996, but I like to go walking in the Rotary Nature Preserve. And if you've been down there, you will notice uh, along the pass various placards that uh, inform you about the uh, flora and fauna and nature of uh, the preserve. And I was surprised to see one day that uh, a little placard telling us about the 1996 flood. And the 1996 flood totally inundated the Tice Woods, which was the name of the woods before it became the Rotary uh, Nature Preserve. And it obliterated all of the infrastructure that had been there when the farmers first settled the area and tried to, to farm a wetland. They did not succeed. But that flood of 1996, of course, flooded the entire Willamette Valley. And the South Yamhill River here in uh, McMinnville crested at 59.33 feet, which was an historical record 10 feet above flood, flood stage. <clears throat> Records show that the Tice Woods which became the Rotary Nature Preserve, was completely inundated, their, their uh, word, taking out all of this infrastructure I referred to. This predates most of the subdivision development to the north of Baker Creek Road, which is just a mile up creek. So we will have to imagine how high the water rose uh, in the Baker Creek Basin at that time. What caused the flood was a pineapple express that brought warming temperatures and 15 inches of rain in four days. Just imagine that. Global warming and the increasing loss of vital habitat is only accelerating these events as we see in the news all too frequently in regions across the US, especially in recent years in California. So we've seen in, with global warming that we have years of drought followed by years of flood. All of the wine country in California burned uh, uh, last year and then this winter, it all flooded. So we have these weather events, uh, what we've traditionally called a Pineapple Express coming straight across the Pacific Ocean. Now they call them atmospheric rivers. It's only a matter of time and I've lived in uh, Washington as well, that we've seen it in Washington, Oregon, California, and it will come again. So I think we need all, thank you, Scott, of the wetlands we can use to absorb what we know is coming. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions of council? Thank you, Scott. We next have James Tyser. Welcome, James. Thank you. I uh, live on Riesling Way, which is, ties into Pinot Noir. Um, I will be the first right-hand turn before Oak Ridge that all 1,200 cars will be taking a shortcut on to head out to back on to Oak Ridge and then to Baker Creek. At any rate, I want to thank all of you for hearing me real quick. Um, I was here at the... Uh, Planning Council's meeting when they rendered their decision and voted. And uh, I'm not uh, opposed to any progress or anybody putting in a subdivision or anything per se. Um, but I definitely think that we need to have an additional road in. And I agree with Mr. Fox's testimony and Mr. Colvin for sure. And when I was at the uh, Planning Commission's meeting the last time, um, the uh, Council for the Developer had uh, <clears throat> made a comment after the recession at 10 p.m. and you can all go back and look at the Bennetts after Mr. Fox had spoke then about 
all these truckloads of dirt about a year or so ago that were being hauled in back into the 108 home area about what was approximated, I believe it was 20,000 yards or so hauled back in and council came back and made a comment that that was to fill in holes for the farmer that was contracting to fill in holes for the farmer. And I happened to be sitting next to the farmer who's a very good friend of mine that farms that and he about came out of his chair back there. It was a complete lie. And it seems that that dirt's been quietly being hauled out of there since that uh, meeting and being hauled to a dress on down West Side Road. And that seems the sense of being ceased to, to be happening now. And I don't know how much of the dirt's been hauled out, but 20,000 yards in a three axle dump truck, that's about 1,500 loads of dirt. And it was all hauled down in there in the lower swale. And if you all go walk that property, the farmers since harvested that grass here about a week and a half or so ago, and all the straw from the grass seeds been hauled away. But I just look at each and every one of you and say that if there's something like that that's been said to the commission that was disingenuous, what else is being said that's disingenuous? Thank you, James. And I just say that, take that into consideration, you know? Thank you. Thank you, James. Any questions? Hearing none, uh, we next have Barbara Boyer. <clears throat> Welcome, Barbara. Good evening, Mayor Hill, Chair Menke, members of the council. I'm Barbara Boyer and I'm pleased to be before you today as chair of your local soil and water conservation district. Although we appreciate the applicant's willingness to modify the application, we feel it does not go far enough. Although the parcel may seem small at 1.47 acres, it is a rare habitat type in McMinnville's UGB and should be preserved as such. Loss of wetlands contribute to decreased flood storage, increased local drought, lower water quality, and loss of unique wildlife habitat. So tonight we've been hearing about a hard deadline that you are up against, but I think it hasn't been mentioned. You can request of the applicant um, for more time on this issue, and it might give you more time to write that letter of a map revision for this project. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Any questions of Barbara? Thank you. Uh, Lon uh, Skini. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, before oh, we move on. Um, staff, uh, the city staff to also address that. My understanding, standing was that um, we, we can't uh, address, uh, request additional time on this particular one, that if there's not a decision rendered, um, that it um, uh, the reverts to the uh, previous approval, or it reverts to approval. Yeah. Excuse me. Um, so the a couple different issues at play there. So so under um, Oregon land use statutes, there is a 120 day time period mm -hmm. with which we have to make a decision as a city government on a land use application such as this. Um, it's 120 days from when the application is deemed complete. Um, based on that timeline, there was a deadline. I think that the staff report addressed that um, early on what those what those timelines were. Um, there have been times during this process uh, where the applicant has requested more time to get information in to meet concerns or, or address uh, concerns that have been raised. Um, 
And in order to um, allow them more time, they have granted a, an extension to that 120 day time period, but that's entirely at the applicant's discretion whether to grant those extensions. In no event can uh, extensions be granted for more than 180 days beyond that initial 120 day period. Uh, so about 120 plus 180 or? Yes, 120 or? plus 180. Um, however, uh, I would note that that is, um, again, entirely at the applicant's discretion whether or not to grant that extension. Um, if they uh, don't grant extensions and we fail to meet the deadline for the city to take action, then they have a right of going uh, directly to circuit court under a writ of review process, no, writ of um, mandamus process, um, and uh, can compel the city essentially to to issue the permit and approval so long as they've they've met the um, the requirements. For the current application, so it does. There's no reversion. It's they've submitted an application. If we don't render a decision within the legal time frame, uh, they have the right to go and request that the, that the city have to issue that decision for their application as submitted originally. Yeah, and I, I would also note that um, there is a provision in the law that prohibits the local government from extorting an extension of time out of an applicant under threat of denial. Um, they anticipated that. So um, we have to, the, the, the whole issue about whether the applicant grants extensions is, you know, has to be a, a good faith uh, back and forth request and, and generally something that the applicant has to, to be in favor of. So um, the, the, the issue of if you did deny this uh, application, the pre existing approvals remain in effect. Um, so the, the prior planned unit, uh, plan development for um, that area remains in effect or would remain in effect. Did that answer your questions? Yes, thank you. And, and just for the record, we're at 201 days right now. Thank you. So, so the, the extensions that have been granted take us to the point where the, the council would need to make a final decision um, adopting findings by no later than its first meeting in August in order to remain within the statutory deadline. Yeah, August 13th. Thank you, David. And I have one more clarification with the city. Just, this is just to clarify also that there's no uh, changing any FEMA maps for this application based on the goalpost rule. Like the, the implication was that more time would enable us to be able to get some different maps in place or something like that, but that's not a possibility either, right? right. If, if the intention is to change our floodplain zone, so our floodplain zone is what manages development in the floodplain and, and in city of McMinnville, we do not allow development in the floodplain. So if the intention is not to allow development in the floodplain and to amend the floodplain zone to represent an extended floodplain zone, put more property into that zone, um, that, is, that changes the goalpost rule because when they came in, the floodplain zone was already established. Just, just confirming. Okay. The conditions of approval that have been discussed tonight that the applicant agrees to do will identify the floodplain and will also ensure that there are no lots developed in the floodplain. Okay. And then we also heard now conflicting testimony regarding the um, quality of the wetland. So, um, what would um, what's our source? Yes. So the division of state lands on the quality of the wetland. Mm -hmm. So they're reviewing it they, and they review it Sorry. for many different cities. <laughs> so their their role and sole focus is administration, management, enforcement of wetlands. Their, their goal is preservation of wetlands, but they also balance that against development within city limits. Okay, so my apologies. Okay. Uh, Lon Skinny. Lon, welcome.
Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's Lon Skeen. Uh, I live at 2578 Northwest Merlot. My house overlooks the intersection of Pinot Noir and Merlot. Um, I have many of the same traffic concerns as Mr. Fox, uh, getting out of my driveway with an increase of traffic, you know, up to, to 200 more cars on a good day uh, will, will not be a pleasurable experience. Uh, much less when any of the landscaping companies show up to do the landscaping in my neighborhood, uh, getting around those vehicles with that much traffic. Uh, it's already bad enough when it's just them. Tack on another car parked across the street, it leaves single lane to get up and down Pino or Merlot. Um, in the planning commission hearing, I think it was June, I raised concerns also around economic feasibility of the two construction companies. Um, many market indicators do indicate an, a downturn in the economy and a recession do. Uh, the, the market bond is inverted and industrial production has also declined, which are definite markers for a recession, which is what inhibited the build out of this back in, I think it was 2005, <coughs> Five, pardon me. Um, what feasibility studies have been done for their ability to continue con conducting business should we hit another recession? Um, do they have the feasibility to continue building uh, and eventually get Shaden approved in five to 10 years um, if there is a downturn in the uh, economy? Uh, that is pretty much it. I just hope to contain or, or you know, maintain the livability of our community. Uh, that many cars, my daughter won't be able to ride a bike down the street. Um, won't be able to cross Baker Creek to catch the school bus. Uh, just overall concerns about general safety. Thank you, Lon. Thank you. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you. Sid Freeman. Is Sid still here? Oh, thank you. And, uh, is it Mark Briarly? Briarly. Welcome, Mark. Thank you. We live on Riesling Way, which is one of the streets that intersects with Pinot Noir. And I would like to add some comments to the other speakers that talked about concerns over the traffic and access. I'd like to start with what appears to me to be a defect in the traffic study. The average daily trips are based on 9.5 trips per household. But keep in mind this development has a public greenway, a lot of open spaces, some public parks. There's no traffic consideration for people using those areas who aren't neighbors in the subdivision. It's assuming that there's going to be no traffic, no outside traffic to those public areas. It's simply based on the number of households and keep in mind it is going to the maximum 1200 ADT. If you add in any other usage for the public areas, you're over the 1200 um, limit for these kinds of streets. Now we already know that there's going to be a second access someday by Shadden Drive. The developer is saying, well, we don't own the property and the city can't force us to use that as a second access now. It's sure strange though, the fire department is able to require that. How's the fire department different than the city in coming along and saying, if you're going to go ahead with this development, you have to put in a second access. All we're asking is that that initial gravel road be open to construction vehicles. And then when the lots are being sold, at that point develop Shadden Drive into public use. At that point, the Shadden, Dri the Shadden um, development is going to be far further along. Stafford will have a better idea at that point where their lots are gonna be, where their utilities, where all their pipes are going to be. Um, so it won't be the problem as if you're putting in that public street today. Um, we've heard that it may be up to five years before the lots are being sold. 
um, Stafford has already presented their application to develop their property. So in five years, when the public needs a second access, it, putting in Shadden Drive will be easier to, to do. Um, it shouldn't be the problem that everyone claims that it would be putting it in today. It appears to me the issue is cost and that this developer simply wants a free ride in pushing the cost of developing Shadden Drive onto Stafford. I can understand where Stafford may not want to be spending the money um, now, but this developer could certainly chip in or pay the cost instead of getting a free ride. Thank you. Any questions? Hearing none. That is the, uh, the last uh, testimony from our, uh, from our public hearing this evening. So what I'm gonna do again before we move on is um, it is 10 after 10. We're gonna take another five minute uh, break and come back and then we will have the applicant uh, have 15 minutes of rebuttal. So uh, we'll be back at 10.15.
All right, Lori. Okay, a um, couple things I'm supposed to address. Jeff? Um, in regards to the Shadden Drive, Gordon Root is not going to allow us to have construction access on his property. Frankly, if it was my property and he was asking me, I wouldn't allow him either because there's just so much that's going on when you're in that development process. You can't have dump trucks and uh, people that you don't know or who are, who are coming and going there during that process. And you can't condition that on this um, subdivision either. I don't own the property. I can't do it. It's not a feasible thing. We are going to do the gravel and we will have to pay for the gravel to make the road appropriate for fire and um, ambulance. So that's that. And um, feasibility, economically feasible. We've studied this. Um, we are in our last uh, lot that we're building up uh, in West Valley Estates. Um, we need lots to build in McMinnville. And um, we believe that this is timely enough and we can get this job done within the five year period that um, we've been, con that is a condition of approval, so. Okay? Okay. Thank you. Lacey? I wanted to address a few of the comments that we heard. Um, one of them was that there would be 200 to 500 vehicles in the morning peak hour when people were trying to get out. Um, and that's just simply not accurate. Um, standard practice says that your peak hour traffic um, is anywhere between eight and 12% of your daily traffic, um, which would give, bring you in the range of 80 to 120 vehicles um, in any given peak hour during the day. So. That's what we expect um, at this location as well. Um, regarding the park, um, this isn't a typical city park that's gonna be a unique attractor. There's not on-street park or um, dedicated parking provided at this location. Um, if we were to include the park, the next closest um, reasonable land use that we could use to estimate would be a planned unit development that includes a variety of uses in addition to residences. Um, and that actually has a lower trip generation estimate. Um, it's 7.5 trips um, as opposed to the 9.5 trips that we used in our study. So if we did try to account for the park, um, the most reasonable um, land use that we would use would actually lower the trip generation of this development. Um, the last thing is just regarding Shadden Drive. Um, as we've shown, there's the existing street system can handle the trips that are gonna be generated by this development. Um, it's also important to remember that the existing street system has always been planned and intended to serve this use. Um, we see this a lot in my line of work where there's a, a phase of a development that lags and pe people have become accustomed to the amount of traffic on their roadways. That doesn't change the fact that these roadways were always intended to serve this traffic. Um, and they were also, it's also, these are public roadways. This isn't Compton Crest access and Oak Ridge access. This is the public street system that is intended to serve the entire community, including the Oak Ridge Meadows development. Okay, thank you. Caroline? Um, I just wanted to reiterate, I think somebody mentioned the type of habitat that the wetland is down there that we delineated. And again, it's 
it's not a rare habitat. It's um, relatively low quality in the sense that, from the perspective of the agencies, Department of State Lands and um, Corps of Engineers, the dominant vegetation is invasive species, such as reed canary grass. Um, and any impacts that are gonna occur will be mitigated for as we discussed before. And um, joint permit applications will be filed with the Corps and DSL. So we'll have to get permits before any of that impact will occur. And as part of um, the core permit process, it goes through DQ um, approval and scrutiny as well. Um, so all of those agencies will have taken a look at this before any impacts occur. Can I ask a question? Yes. So the, this um, not rare habitat or the, the, the quality of the wetland. So um, the testimony that we received that seems to be conflicting what you're saying came from um, the Yamhill County Soil and Water Conservation District. Okay. Um, uh, so, uh, so what, um, I guess, what standards are you using to um, identify what's uh, rare or needed or important in an area? Um, and I'm, I'm, I, I'm asking this, I guess I just wanna give some context in the sense that um, while it was an individual that came up and testified, they testified on behalf of our uh, area soil and water conservation district and um, we're here uh, as also a, an elected official and so that um, uh, testimony is really coming from a body via that one person mm -hmm. um, and so that that gives me a pause to hear that type of conflicting information that they're saying it's it's rare and important to our area and, and to hear you saying that it's not rare and, and not important well, when to our area. I, I'm curious to find out what that person's definition or um, soil and conservation services definition is when they're saying it's a rare habitat. I mean, there must be some criteria um, in their viewpoint that it's meeting to say it's rare. Um, we don't typically uh, describe a wetland as being rare. I mean, we can say the functional value is high if it's got a lot of vegetative structure. For example, there's a lot of native species. It's, it's got herbaceous species in addition to maybe an understory as well as an overstory of canopy. And so you've got a forested um, type of situation and you've got maybe diversity in that you've got herbaceous, um, dominated wetland intermixed with scrub shrub wetland. So there's multiple strata involved. So then then you have more diversity, you have more native species, then it's um, a more complex type of wetland. And so the functional value habitat wise and quality wise is is higher. So that's sort of the perspective we look at it as well. And what are your qualifications? Uh, well, I've been doing this for 23 years um, in Oregon, and um, you know we've I've been through the whole permitting process with the Corps and DSL, and um, starting from doing uh, wetland delineations as well as all the report writing. So I've seen a variety of um, wetlands throughout all of Oregon, really. Do you have any specialized Southern. training? Um, I am a professional wetland scientist, mm -hmm. that's my background. Um, and just the amount of experience, I've seen a lot of changes through the ordinances and regulatory agencies. Um, things have changed a lot in the time I've been doing this. Um, and so you said um, the, the word rare, just to clarify, that was, I jotted that down when, when you were first speaking, you said it was not rare habitat, but then you, but then you said you don't usually identify a habitat or wetlands as being rare or not rare. So yeah, like rare um, is maybe you would, we think of it as more of a wildlife term of rare and endangered species or um, fauna or flora, but not particularly in wetlands, we look more at the quality and what functional value it serves. And that's typically what the agencies look at too. 
So if you remove that function, um, how can you mitigate for it, you know? That's the okay. end of my question, thank you. Okay. Continue. Okay, thank you. So I think we're about ready to wrap up and I just wanna really reinforce, thank you very much for your time and your attention you know, kind of considering this application, I know you've seen an awful lot of material. From the applicant's point of view, I sincerely appreciate the comments of the opponents. I think it has made the project even better. I think moving the lots as we propose to do, reducing the wetland impact down to, you know, 0.9 acres, I think it ultimately um, makes a better, better project. We have addressed all of the concerns. The project meets all relevant approval standards. There was a concern raised about flooding. <clears throat> the project as proposed to be conditioned will eliminate any concern about flooding. There will be a study that is provided to the city. The city will um, and the public will be assured uh, with a professional engineer's stamp that there will be no rise in the regulatory 100 year floodplain and no downstream impacts. We've heard from your professional staff as well as the planning commission and the applicant that there are no uh, traffic concerns related to this project. It meets all relevant approval standards. The city street system in this area was designed to do what it's going to do and to handle this development. There aren't our streets and your streets. These are all of our streets. These are McMinnville city streets. We heard people say they wanted to be sure that DSL would, uh, approval would be sought and obtained. There's a condition of approval about that that says that DSL's approval must be obtained. Policy 78, you've heard uh, that your professional staff have explained that it is met here. Uh, it is met if the city uh, traffic standards are met, and they are. Um, in all, there's, the, the applicants worked really hard and somebody suggested that the applicant uh, was, you know, pinching pennies. And I can promise you the assembled cast of characters that she has hired to really take a hard look at this subdivision and make sure that it's the very best that it can be and something that people can be proud of, you can be proud of and our neighbors can be proud of, has not been inexpensive. She's uh, done everything to make sure that that this is a really good project. And so um, really hope that you can see your way through to approve this subdivision as we propose based on the recommendation of your, pro your professional staff, your planning commission, and the really hard work that the applicant has done. So thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Lori. Okay. Um, any questions, any further questions of either of the applicant? Not seeing that, then I will, does the, I will ask the question, does the council wish to continue or close the hearing? Close? I wish to close. Okay. Yes. I will go ahead and close the public hearing. Um, the applicant is allowed at least seven days after the record is closed uh, to all other parties to submit final written arguments in support of the application. Does the applicant waive this seven day period? Yes. Okay. Does any counselor wish to discuss the application further? Okay, let's, um, I think Adam, we'll start with you if you're prepared and just work our way down and. Yeah, I mean, overall, I, I like the layout of the subdivision. Um, I like the concessions that the applicants made, just the, the barrier that I can't get over is um, the traffic flow and only having one access point until, you know, five to 10 years down the road when Stafford's developed to mitigate some of the, the daily trips that's going to be put on Oak Ridge and Merlot. Um, that's 70, 30% split. I mean, there's 
apparently it's best practices for that, but if you move that number to an 80, 20% split, then Oak Ridge is over their 1,200 average, average daily trip threshold. So uh, I don't know. I just I feel that at uh, one, one access point for that many homes, is going to put undue stress on on the other neighborhoods, and I, that that's just a hurdle I haven't been able to get over yet. Okay, Sal. Yeah, I I um, want to say I think the applicant has done a, a really <clears throat> really appreciate the time and the energy and the money that you guys have put into trying to prepare a good application, and uh, I share some of uh, Adam's concerns about the uh, impact on the on the neighboring streets. I think the rule 78, the policy 78 uh, is the one that I, I'm not sure they've quite met that bar with me. And the reason for it is that when I look at the traffic uh, patterns, you have uh, 1,200 average daily trips and from my point of view, that moves it from a local residential street to right on the border of being a neighborhood connector street. And to me, that changes the character of the transportation through the neighborhood. And so that's the hurdle that I'm having a hard time with. The rest of it, I feel like they've really mitigated the the wetlands issue as much as they're able and we're not able to apply those rules kind of retroactively anyway, although I do have serious concerns about the, the wetlands there uh, in general, but, but, but that rule 78 is the one that I'm struggling with. Okay. I'm gonna skip Kelly for a moment and end with her and uh, move down to Zach. <laughs> um. Yes, I think um, at first glance, I was excited um, from my time on the Planning Commission that things came through, um, that the word, the idea of giving up and developing a cool park, especially along water access was um, foreign to some people. I was excited that it was included in that and uh, there's a lot um, in the development that is, 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 is um, it's pretty good, um, but I think significantly concerns about traffic and movement, um, I, I share with my first two counselors, um, specifically 78, 30, 117, 118, 121, and then maybe even capstone with 132.24.00. Uh, I just think it really compromises a lot of safety of the neighborhood. And if the primary rebuttal has been, well, I don't own that land to put the road through, it doesn't mean that we still have to allow it to go through. I, I, it, it more means that that area is not safe yet to develop because there aren't the ability, there isn't the ability to get two points of access to it. So I'm struggling with that. Or, and that, that's where I'm currently at. Thank you, Zach. Remy? Um, well, uh, I, Let's see where to begin. So there's a lot. Um, there's a lot in this application that I that I also really like. Um, uh, the uh, wetland preservation that is included. Um, uh, I really appreciate the applicants. Um, uh, relocation of those five lots, and I especially appreciate that it um, decreased the size of, uh, of the, the lots on the other side of Pinehurst, um, and, uh, and I'm hopeful that there will be a, that, that will, will then be reflected in, in price um, from the onset. Um, I wish I could find my, the very first version of the staff report that we had, because that one has the most most initial notes in it, but um, it's lost to me at this moment. But, um, but uh, I was also, um, uh, f from the get-go, uh, uh, interested, intrigued, and, and happy to see the, what had developed in terms of 
um, changes for lot sizes um, and, and setbacks and and um, uh, and working on a, a, a unique approach to um, the development. Um, I uh, absolutely understand that we cannot require um, as a condition um, the, the use of Shadden Drive. I'm not at all unclear on that. Um, but also, um, am having similarly served two terms on the Planning Commission and now my second term on City Council also understand the importance of um, uh, through this public hearing process, um, the ability to ask questions and um, perhaps um, uh, come to a better understanding, um, not just for the, the council, but for everybody of, of um, the true root of concerns and what, if any, um, resolutions are uh, available to leave everybody feeling more, um, more complete. Um, I am also troubled by this recent knowledge, not only in terms of this development, but um, for our city generally, you know, what's kind of come to light, um, not only about our policies, but um, but also our, our uh, the state of things in regards to these FEMA firm maps, and that, that gives me concern for the entire city. Um, uh, I, I haven't um, had a lot of, we haven't had a lot of uh, developments come through in my time where there's been wetland mitigation, so um, that has also been a, um, Something that's that at a higher, you know, uh, at a not specific to this development, but at a policy level, is raising a lot of questions for me about how we do want to proceed as a city and um, what our priorities are, and um, and being aware of of um, changes that that are occurring um, not only in our geography but in our climate and how that will impact developments now and in the future. Um, and as, as we've experienced uh, even recently, you know, sometimes this information comes out and then it vastly changes the, the, um, the paths we can take. Um, uh, just recently when we were, um, uh, you know, applying through affordable housing for that house bill, and we had to do a land evaluation, and it turned out all of McMinnville was built on high-value farmland. Um, right? These are surprising uh, revelations, um, but they're—I think—they're important and something that we we take into consideration. And, and it's not just a, a pass-through piece of information. Um, and so, you know, I think. It, Kind of, in summary, there's been a, a lot of valid concerns that are raised. Um, it, it, it doesn't change. Um, it doesn't change that um, the, the the things that I appreciate about this development and um, uh, and the the great work that's gone into it, um, not only on behalf of the applicant but also um, by our city staff. Um, and, uh, and that great work. Uh, also doesn't mitigate all of my uh, reservations with some of this other information that's come up. Thank you, Remy. Wendy? Um, okay, so I also am really appreciative. There's a, I appreciate the thoughtful testimony on both, on all sides. Um, the application was super thorough. All of the, um, testimony from the experts was super helpful. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, the staff reports, many reports, <laughs> uh, were excellent, very, very well put together. And um, the opposing testimony brought up some really good things for us to think about. Uh, and I think they're really valid concerns that people are expressing in a really respectful way that clearly has been really thought through. So thank you everybody for the public dialogue that we've had tonight. Uh, there's a lot that I really like about the development of the green space um, in the floodplain is excellent. I'm really appreciative that that was put into the plan and the neighborhood park. 
uh, preserving most of the wetlands that uh, you were able to. And I also want to acknowledge the applicant for the changes that were made in response to the testimony. I think that that shows a lot of interest in um, producing a better product with the information that you're getting. Um, so thank you for that. Um, one of the things I spent quite a bit of time on the Planning Commission, and one of the things that is hard in these uh, decisions is the separation between quasi-judicial and legislative. A lot of the concerns that, that w were raised um, with the FEMA maps and things like that, they're what's called the legislative, and that's what Heather refers to as the policy decisions, which do not apply to us as the quasi-judicial. What we do is we take the current set of ordinances that we have and we act as judges and we interpret those ordinances to say whether or not this application meets those ordinances. So in that light, I would like to ask Mike to talk a little bit about our requirements for uh, the traffic so that we can be better informed because the reality is we can't make a decision based on the feeling. We need to make a decision based on evaluating what the requirements are currently and whether or not this applicant met those requirements. And so I'm hoping that you might be able to shed some light on the concerns that have been expressed by some of the other counselors with regards to specifically what is the criteria that we're evaluating whether or not this application met that criteria for traffic specifically. Can you uh, help us with a little bit more clarity on that? Sure, I'll, I'll attempt to do so and, and then um, perhaps just open it up for further questions from the council regarding that. But there is um, a testimony in the record from the applicant, uh, from a registered uh, traffic engineer that demonstrates that the local street network, um, both the existing street network and the proposed network as part of the development meets the city's standards for local street traffic. Um, uh, you've been provided um, that initial traffic study as well as supplemental traffic studies that looked at intersection capacity and demonstrated that the uh, traffic generated by this development and adjacent developments uh, will result in intersections that operate safely within the city standards. And so those are the thresholds that we evaluate when we review the applicant's materials. Mm. Did not find... Uh, um, uh, anything unreasonable in their uh, analysis um, and certainly uh, I understand Councillor Garvin's concerns that if you change the in, the assumptions that are in analysis you might get different results but that's what the registered traffic engineer is paid to do and they provided that information to us for consideration mm -hmm. there the standards that are in your adopted transportation system plan are thresholds um, there is uh, 1200 um, a vehicle per day threshold for local street standards. And then as we discussed um, in response to uh, Councillor Peralta's question, the next level of street in our network is a neighborhood connector street, which carries up to 3000 vehicles a day, but it's the same dimension. So it's a 28 foot wide street within a 50 foot wide right away, same travel lanes, same parking on both sides, same width sidewalks, but it calls for us to pay more attention to um, intersection safety and pedestrian safety. As we do all over the city, as this development occurs, if we're getting concerns related to traffic safety issues, we do have the ability to make adjustments. We routinely make adjustments to parking uh, to make sure we have sight distance at intersection. We routinely make adjustments to traffic control, whether it be signage um, or traffic signals. Um, we have in, uh, in no small um, uh, part response to some of the concerns with uh, this neighborhood, we've evaluated uh, is the time right to restripe Baker Creek Road to add a center mm -hmm. turn lane and stripe bike lanes. That work will happen next week. Mm -hmm. Put it in the budget, the city council considered it. We've awarded a contract for that. And uh, next week, weather permitting, we'll stripe a center turn lane from approximately Crimson Court all the way to Hill Road uh, to address some of the concerns that this neighborhood has. So mm -hmm. the city does have over time the ability to respond to traffic concerns um, and to address traffic issues within neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. uh, 
the proposal that's in front of you meets the standards that we have in place, and that's um, uh, the reason why the staff advanced the set of conditions that are in the staff report for your consideration. Okay. Can you give us an example of what would trigger something not to meet the standards for like, if it would be a traffic um, report that we would get that it exceeded the, the number of um, trips on the street, that would be a criteria that we could consider then. So a, a re, an example that comes to mind where um, as, as the West Hills has developed, um, there were significant um, portions of the West Hills, um, west of Hill Road, mm -hmm. north of 2nd Street. There are master plan for multiple phases of development. We had a traffic study done as part of that uh, proposal, which was several hundred lots. And that study found that at a certain number of building permits in the West Hills, we're gonna need a left turn lane on Hill Road, south of 2nd Street. So it's a condition of approval that the information provided by the applicant and their traffic engineer demonstrated that there was a future need that at a certain threshold, an improvement needed to be made, and that was included as a condition of approval. Mm -hmm. so that routinely happens as part of a development application. If the material submitted indicate that an improvement is needed, then that improvement is conditioned um, to be um, uh, made at the time that the, the threshold is reached. So okay. that, that is very common. Okay, All right, thank you. So oh, um, I guess what I will say is I feel like they, the applicant has done an excellent job, has met all the conditions that we can look at tonight. I do support um, the, the legislative side of it. I think it's brought up a ton, a lot, a number of different questions that I'd like to look at from a policy perspective, but it doesn't apply to this application because this is quasi-judicial. So I would like for us as a community to look at updating our FEMA maps, which I know that was already in progress. Um, <laughs> so, um, and just to make sure that we're doing our due diligence to be well prepared for anything that comes up in the future. But um, I appreciate all of the responsiveness of the applicant that enables us to address some of these concerns even without going into, to outside of our realm of being able to touch legislative things that would change the goalposts for them. So. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, Kelly? Well, thank you, Wendy, for handing, handling very gracefully something I might not have handled nearly as gracefully. <laughs> um, I want to thank the staff for keeping us updated continuously throughout this process. Excellent job. And providing excellent explanations and interpretations and God only knows what else. But thank you. You've done a fabulous job. To the applicant, I want to say you are anything but cheap. <laughs> Let me tell you, I know you're spending a lot of money. And I think you've presented your case very well. You've mitigated most, almost everything there is to mitigate in this particular situation. And I really appreciate the effort you've gone to to make this possible. I feel strongly that all the criteria have been met and that this should be approved. We do not have, I mean, it's, it's as Wendy said, it's an issue of legislative versus uh, quasi-judicial, and they have met the criteria in spades. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, from my perspective, I would just truly uh, thank the applicant and uh, those opposed uh, for sharing with the council tonight uh, this project. Um, I'll tell you, it's more reading than I've done in a long time. <laughs> uh, put in with vacation, I've been carrying books around with me. But I appreciate from a council perspective the ability for us to really get involved in the land use. Uh, area. We have a great planning commission. Not very often do we have this opportunity to really get back into the judicial piece and, and update ourselves with the state of affairs when it comes to development. So I appreciate that. Um, uh, 
We've been in the city about 27 years. When we moved here initially, our backyard was a big field. Kids would go out and play. Today, there's a grade school, there's Discovery Meadows, and Goucher has become a major thoroughfare. It's going to become a major thoroughfare when we close Old Sheridan Road, because everybody from the south is going to be going past us. I understand the impact of traffic. I really do. I've lived through it over the last 25 years. My greatest concern for this is the construction traffic. <laughs> That's the thing that really hits my heart a little bit. And if there'd be any way that we could get around that, that's the thing that scares me with kids out on the front yard and on the sidewalk. Not necessarily, I, I truly feel that the traffic studies have shown that those roads can handle the increased traffic, but it's the construction traffic that I, that I am most concerned about. But I'll come back and the hurdle has been hit from my perspective. We're taking a very difficult piece of land and we're creating, I think, something that McMinnville can be proud of when it's done. Uh, you know, we just finished our housing need assessment and we need homes. We need homes very badly in this community. And to see that being addressed, I'm very, I'm very positive about that. Um, I don't have the opportunity to vote unless there's a tie. Uh, but I thank the applicant for the job of bringing this information in a, in a very discernible way to us to understand. Staff, thank you. Um, this has been a large, tedious process in a time where we're doing so many other things. But it's good for all of us to do this, to make sure that this community continues down the path and, and follows uh, the comprehensive plan and the, the codes that we need to. So with that being said, we've already had, well, let me, we have three separate ordinances uh, for the proposed applicants or application. Uh, ordinance 5065 addresses the first proposed plan development uh, amendment, PDA 3-18. Ordinance 5069 is for the second proposed plan development amendment, PDA 418. Ordinance uh, number 5070 is for the proposed subdivision S318, which is contingent upon the approval of PDA 318 and PDA A418. We've already had the first reading of each ordinance. Are we ready for a second reading of ordinance 5065 for the first proposed plan development amendment, PDA A318? Yes. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. It has been moved by uh, Council President Mankey. It's been seconded by uh, Councilor Stassen. <coughs> um, Will the city attorney read ordinance number 5065 for a second reading? This is a second reading of ordinance number 5065, an ordinance amending plan development ordinance number 4722 to remove approximately 11.47 acres from the boundary of the Oak Ridge plan development overlay district. Thank you, David. Can we please have a roll call? Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, we've already done. Um, will the, as, will, uh, can we have a roll call vote for ordinance 5065? Melissa? Councilor Dropkin? Is there not a motion? For we did. We had a, yeah. council, a motion from Councilor Mankey. There's a motion. It was, yeah, motion from Councillor Mankey and a second by, by Stassen. Councillor Stassen. Yeah. And, yeah. Okay. So we're calling for the vote right now. We had a second reading and then we're calling for a vote. Can I ask a question real quick? What's that? Can I ask a question real quick? Sure. So if both PDAs are approved, but then the subdivision plan was voted down, what happens? Heather? Um, so, first of all, you'd have to provide a reason for denial of the subdivision plan. 
Um, and then what they would need to do is they, they would then have a new, the PDA sort of provides the frame in which the development will occur. So then they would be, they would have the opportunity to come back with another subdivision plan that fits the frame. I would also note um, in the, the procedures that if there is a condition of approval that um, would allow for them to meet the criteria, then we have to consider that con imposing that condition of approval prior to an outright denial of the application. So if, for example, hypothetically, there was concern about traffic, I'm not saying there is or isn't, um, if there's a condition of approval that would that would meet that concern um, or mitigate that concern and allow for the application to meet the, the criteria, um, then that would need to be considered, um, should be considered prior to outright denial. Mr. City Attorney, could you yes. tell me what kind of a condition that would be? So, um, if you, 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 first of all, you'd have to identify what what criteria um, you believe was not met by the by the application, and then um, what condition could be imposed upon the proposal uh, or the approval in order to ensure that that condition was met. So, and can you see at this time any reason why that that condition was not met? I, I, without, uh, we're, we're talking hypothetically here. Uh -huh. um, so I, I don't know what the criterion would be that, that somebody might identify not being met, um, okay. but I, but that would need to be done. And then we would have to have a discussion if, if that was the majority uh, consensus of the council about whether it was possible to meet that condition through um, either a new condition or a modification of an existing condition of approval. Um, but it can't be based on a feeling, correct? And and pass Luba. It, it would be um, it would be best uh, for the um, approval to be based on objective, clear, and objective standards. Um, and if there's a um, Let's say, for example, there's a hypothetical concern about the the number of dwelling units. I brought this up last time. Um, and there's a concern that 108 uh, generates 1,200 trips, and that's just too much. Um, at what level, and, and you wanted to require a secondary access. The question is, at what level does that kick in? Is it at the first new home? Is it at the 10th new home? Is it at the 100th new home, or is it the 108th new home? And um, what is that based on? Um, is it based on a gut feeling? That's going to be a little harder to defend. Is it based on objective criteria or measurement or, or, or study or plans that are in place? That's easier to defend. Um, and so th that's that's what I challenge the the council to think about. If that you know is an area that that is of concern, that that if we're going to um, impose a standard um, that you cannot build. X number of dwellings without a secondary point of access that you need to identify what that number is, if it's one, even one new home, um, or if it's 50 new homes, or if it's whatever it is, um, and then have a basis for, for imposing that requirement. Mr. Mayor, I'm, I'm getting the sense that we need more dial. Can we have more discussion? Absolutely. Because I'm... Could I just answer Councillor Garvin's question for a quick minute? So to, to the point of if we approve and then what happens with the subdivision, um, just, just to clarify, so PDA 418, the second plan development amendment that combines the two, um, all the acreage together, does have embedded language in it that says that the tentative subdivision plan is embedded in this PDA and zoned to the property. That is a classic practice for the city of McMinnville because what it does is it says we've approved this development and that's what what and only we've approved for this property and it's now zoned onto it as a PDA. So if the concern is the layout of the subdivision and, and all the amenities associated with it, that's that the adopting and approving PDA 4-18 is going to approve that layout itself. If it's phasing in terms of construction and things of that nature, that's the conditions that you find in the subdivision use approval. Thank you. Oh. Yeah, totally. And the other thing I would say is as you as you discuss this um, and develop basis, that basis moves forward with a future land use decision-making processes too. You're setting precedent, basically. Like a judge. 
So we, we have a motion, we have a second, but I'll open it up to discussion if we need more discussion. And what's on the board is every, uh, the whole menu all at once? No, no. Oh. We're just doing, we're doing uh, ordinance number 5065 right. first. And, and Mayor, if I can clarify for the people who made the motion, is that as amended based on uh, the staff's recommendations for conditions? Yes. Right. So we'll, we'll My apology for not being clear. Uh, one more question for Mike. Is there, other than the Doral neighborhood, uh, Mike Wilk, 4th edition, is there another neighborhood you're aware of that's solo access? Yeah, the Cozine Woods development off of Old Sheridan Road has, um, I was trying to listen and count houses, but it's, it's well over 100 houses. Um, on a single access onto Old Sheridan Road. It does have streets ex ex that extend to boundaries of that subdivision that plan for future extension and future connections. But um, that, that was another example that came to mind that's been developed since I've been with the city. Thank you. Further discussion? <clears throat> um, Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, so from my point of view, the biggest impact on this is the is the impact on the on the the the, the surrounding neighborhoods, and I do think that there is an objective difference between a local kind of low volume residential street and a neighborhood connector street. I, I live on a neighborhood connector street. We get a lot of traffic, Davis. Um, there's a lot of traffic on Davis. Uh, and that's fine with us. We bought the house knowing that. But a lot of the folks who are in, you know, the two subdivisions that are affected by this, they bought their houses with a certain type of neighborhood in mind. And it's been that way for 15, 20 years. And I, uh, this, this seems to me to be, you know, significantly um, changing it um, in a way that yeah, I... Yeah, but this... This has been on the books for almost as long. So yeah, these people the, had to know that this was a possibility. There's only it's one. like I know they're going to eventually build out in the West Hills. I'd rather they didn't do it. But I know it will happen. And I'm boy, the traffic will increase. And I would be fine with it if there were two connect if there were two points of access to get into that neighborhood so that it didn't dump everything into one onto one street. I, I would be more comfortable with it. But I I feel that it changes the character of of that neighboring property, and I think that's an objective standard. So, you know, um, Kelly and I had the opportunity to be a part of the discussion in 2005. We're the only two that were there, and again, there was great discussion at that time that this subdivision was coming in, and we talked and we limited the number of of units that could be put at that particular time on that street. Uh, so it is no knowledge that if that was ever going to be developed, it was going to come back on Pinot Noir because we just knew at that time there wasn't even a planned development for, that was just a, that's a farmer's field. And we knew that there was only one access to that. So to, to understand where Kelly's coming from is we had that opportunity to be a part. We were brand new. It was the first public hearing we'd ever been to. We were scared out of our minds because uh, <laughs> it was a contentious, uh, <laughs> I remember Very that. contentious. You know, um, but the thought of not knowing that at some point Pinot Noir was going to have a lot more traffic, that's been around since 2005. And the other thing is, within five years, Shadden will be there. I mean, at the most, this is a five-year issue. Other comments? I didn't mean to set things off. As the, um, so that, uh, has that August, thir that August 13th, I, I appreciate and don't want to delay a decision um, for the applicant, and I, and I want you uh, to, to know and, and, and that I mean that very sincerely. I, I believe you're entitled to a decision as quickly as possible. Um, uh, I also, um, especially on issues that are so weighted, have always um, uh, really disliked making um, late night decisions. <laughs> um, well. I mean, it's a long time, it's a lot of, and then in this specifically a lot of information, including a lot of information that came yesterday. Um, 
And <clears throat> so is that August, do, do we have within that time frame without, um, uh, without uh, injury, we have until August 13th to render a decision, is that correct now? Yes, currently your deadline is August 13th. So you could, I don't know the process from Robert's rules, but you could do your second reading and discussion and vote on August 13th. Where it's problematic is if there is a decision um, to amend findings and create new bases, we'll be doing it that night rather than we're concerned about this staff. We'd like you to go in this direction. Can you spend the next week or two evaluating, scripting, legally, you know, defending a finding that does this and bring it back to us on August 13th? So, um, so technically we have that time frame. We could delay the decision, but um, if we were to, if there were additional conditions, conditions that we wanted, then it, then it becomes more on the fly. So you, you could ask for additional conditions tonight that address some of these traffic concerns, for instance, and, uh, and this is hypothetical, but setting that parameter that um, David has mentioned more than once, that is there a, um, is there a point at which a second access road is required or, or the, something of that nature? Is, is that clear? Because I know I'm not even, I'm not yeah, speaking clearly. Uh, what I, it, it, rather than, you know, I don't really like this. It doesn't feel good. There's a big change for people who bought into the early phase of the subdivision when the rest of the subdivision wasn't built out. Can you put a finding together? You know, give us, give us specificity <laughs> um, so that we understand what the basis is because, because it is precedent setting. So this, you know, it, it will affect future developments as well. It will also affect how we densify and, and develop as a community, so. I'm not saying we can't do it. We just need your specificity in terms of what yeah. your concerns are. And to provide more context, when staff is reviewing not just this application, but all future applications that are going to have transportation impacts on existing neighborhoods, we are guided now by the adopted transportation system plan and the traffic counts that are laid out in there for establishing what the what, what thresholds exist for local neighborhoods. If, if the, it's the council's desire that we not rely on those, but instead rely on some different threshold that you're gonna establish through this process, that needs to be well articulated so that we can replicate that in future reviews. Know that you're gonna have to have a basis for deviating from that adopted transportation system plan. So you need to be able to articulate that, the basis for why it, the following those standards don't meet the comprehensive plan criteria and, and give us direction so that we can draft that, those findings to back it up if you wanna deviate from that. We're not saying you can't, but it has to be well articulated um, so that we can, can write those conditions in a way that it's well understood by everybody and we can replicate that in future matters that come before the city that have similar impacts. Is that? Further discussion? That, to me, setting precedent uh, late at night, too, is, is a tough thing. <laughs> well, and I, I guess uh, to address Sal's concern, I mean, one of the things that he, that, uh, Sal doesn't have the background on is that every big planning decision has changes the nature of neighborhoods. We've had, in the 10 years I was on the planning commission, we've had, we had so much testimony from neighbors that were concerned about that very thing, that their nature of their neighborhood has changed by a plan, major planning decision. And so my concern about setting a precedent that that is our criteria means that we don't make planning decisions. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like we can't have that as a criteria. We can't set that precedent. So it needs to be something else. If there's, if you can articulate some other criteria we use to identify. I, I, I guess I'm criteria. confused, Wendy, because I, I feel like I have articulated a, a condition. I've heard three different people tell me that I haven't, but I've 
kind of clearly said that there's a difference in my mind mm -hmm. between a residential street and an arterial connection. Mm -hmm. That changes the character of, of the neighborhood, that changes the character of the street. To me, that's an objective criteria. But the data does not say that it becomes an arterial. It does, though. It puts it right at the border. 1,200 is, the, is, is, is the border. you know, if, if it's 1,201, you're over, and if it's, if it's 1,200, you're below. And to me, that is a very arbitrary distinction. What we know is that it hugely increases the traffic to the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for this five or 10 year period, however long it's gonna take. Mm -hmm. I think the testimony we heard tonight was closer to 10 than five before this project gets built out. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's my view. So so if I'm, I wanna make sure that I'm hearing you correctly, Sal, because based on what you said, um, at 1191, 1191 and a half, which would basically be 107 dwelling units, we'd be below that 1200 threshold. And so 107 is okay, but before they get the 108th building permit, a second access need to be provided. That's the level of specificity. I didn't, I, didn't set the, I didn't set the number of 1200 for what constitutes a residential street versus a non-residential street, okay? that That's in our city code or it's in state policy. That's not my number. That's the numbers that we use. It seems to me that the only objective criteria that we have to determine whether the, char the character of a transportation route changes mm -hmm. is whether or not those categories move, right? What other objective criteria are there? Mm -hmm. yeah. Time, time, you know, so if that category moves, it seems to me that we've changed the character of the neighborhood. So, but that's, but that's, what, that's what I'm trying to understand is it, at what point if 1,200 is too much because it's at that threshold, what is, the, to guide staff, because we're gonna have to take this and, and actually write it out if that's the direction the council goes, help us understand what what that new number is then. Well, he's, comfortable. Is, does it change the situation for it to become, if it's a neighborhood street versus a connector? The twelve, the twelve hundred number is the is the threshold. As far as I could tell from this, the uh, traffic report, it's a, they were project, projecting out uh, one thousand twenty as being the maximum. That it would, it's not twelve hundred. There was one for for, for a section of Pinot Noir. It is twelve hundred. It's for that that ex existing section that's built today. That for, that. Phase three of the Oak Ridge subdivision that was built today, it's it's 1,200 as you migrate. If you remember Jamie's uh, graph that he put up there where he had the colored dots as you migrate down to right. the red okay. dot, that's where the 1,200 exists. It's right there at the intersection. Um, so the, the discussion would be if, if 1,200 feels like it's too much congestion on a local residential street for neighborhood compatibility, what is the number? And then that essentially changes the average daily trips threshold for a local residential street. So if we backed it down to 107, which seems really foolish to me, but if we did, that would put us within the realm of under a... You know, I'm a little frustrated. Can, can I, I say something real quick, Sal? Please. Go ahead, Adam. Okay, so Doral has 80 houses on a single access. Cozine has 130 houses on a single access. Currently, Oak Ridge has 82 houses. If you add 108 to that, that's 190 houses on a single access. The applicant diverted 30% of those to Compton Crest. Still at that, that's 152 houses on a single access. If you've been back in the Cozine area, it's very congested. I get that in our policy, it's 1,200 daily trips. I personally don't see the livability in that in the city of McMinnville. I'm fine with setting precedent to lower that number. And, and, the, and, the, and the question simply is, please, please, please. The question simply is, what is that number? And, and, and that's what staff needs to know. We can't be left to guess. And so I'm not, nobody, I'm not saying you can't do that, but we need to know what that number is. And, and I get that, but I wanted to have that discussion on the dais and not me just say this is a number that, you know, and I don't know if tonight at 11, 17 p.m. is the best time to be having that discussion. But right, and, I, and I, I just would like to add, I mean, to me, the conversation has been a little bit frustrating because it feels like we're being pushed into making a decision 
Um, like, you, 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 you can say no, but you need to back it up with a legal brief, is what I'm hearing tonight. Yeah, and, you do. And, and that's and that, the nature and, of and a quasi-judicial process. But, but, but let me just say no, because a lot of times when we come up with a policy decision, staff will take a look at that. And, and, and I, again, I feel like there has been a, a rational basis given. Now, you guys might not agree with the rational basis that we've given. And I, I clearly, staff does not agree. But, but that doesn't mean that there wasn't some kind of, that there hasn't been some kind of a basis given. And, and, and I'm going through the city traffic plan and I have a question actually about um, cut through traffic. What, what exactly is, how do we define cut through traffic? Because it, it says that that should be discouraged in our traffic plan, is that, and, and yet it seems to me that we're essentially cutting through two neighborhoods to get to the main surface connector instead of a single street like going through on Shadden right from the start, so. Mike, Mike can you answer that for Sal? Help, help me with the specific reference you're referring to, Sal. Uh, I am referring to Appendix 4 from the, let me pull it up, from the transportation plan, recommended access management policy. And if you just do a search for cut through, you will find the reference that I'm referring to. But basically, it, it, it basically at the time we adopted the, the, the um, transportation plan, it, one of the contingencies was that cut through traffic should be discouraged. So in the context of the larger transportation network, um, you have a hierarchy of street system. The, the highest level is your major arterial streets, which is Highway 99. You move down to um, minor arterials, which are Second Street, Hill Road, Lafayette Avenue. You move down to the collector streets, which feed into the arterial streets. And then you move down to the local neighborhood connector and the residential. So that hierarchy is meant to carry different levels of traffic. Um, the cut through traffic that we're discouraging is, um, although we have very strong policies in our comp plan that, that uh, um, encourage a grid network to provide transportation alternatives, we don't want to use that grid network to take traffic off the higher classification streets and run them through the neighborhoods. It's a completely different distinction than this residential area being developed with a system of local residential streets that's intended to carry residential traffic. So it's really intended to say, we don't want to take uh, traffic off a second street and divert it onto a local street because they're avoiding congestion on second street. And so that's the cut through. That's the appendix you're talking about is traffic calming, I believe. I don't have my TSP in front of me, but it, in, it in, includes a series of um, traffic calming techniques that can be implemented that help discourage traffic, uh, cut through traffic, whether it's traffic islands, chicanes, um, sorts of things, that, uh, speed humps, none of those which we have in our network now, but as we grow as a community and we do have pinch points that develop from a traffic standpoint, we can start to look at traffic calming techniques that help keep local neighborhood traffic at a local neighborhood level, and we're not putting the major system traffic on those streets. You see those uh, traffic calming techniques used in larger cities around us, and as we grow as a community, I expect we'll start to have to uh, uh, investigate and install similar techniques. But that's the kind of cut through that that policy is talking about. It's not intended to say that when a next phase of a subdivision develops, that traffic can't come through a prior phase of a subdivision. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mike, for the clarification. I, I have a question for, I'm not sure if it's Mike or Heather. <laughs> um, I, I, uh, I wonder uh, the threshold that Sal and Adam are concerned about is when the subdivision is all built out. So is there anything we can do to say like at, and, and that would be that the transition is the, absolute most of 
it's that 12, one 1200 number. Is there anything that we can do that would establish that only a certain percentage of the lots can be developed before a second access or something like that? Or is that too, I'm just trying to think of how, it seems like most of the, I mean, this development isn't gonna happen all at once. It's gonna be over five years. So it's not like we're gonna get to that 1200 number. So, so currently that's, that's how it's structured, but structured under the threshold that's established in the TSP. So mm -hmm. if, if you recall, there's a condition of approval in there that says 100, that, be, that only 108 dwelling units can be built. So it's not specific to lots, it's specific to units based on what's built on a lot. Um, only 108 dwelling units can be built before there is a second access to this neighborhood because the premise right now is that the threshold for local residential streets is 1,200 average daily trips. Mm -hmm. And so if the discussion is 1,200 average daily trips doesn't feel right and we need to reduce that threshold, then we would then reduce that condition of approval down to whatever it is, whatever the nexus is for that. We just need to know what's the basis for changing it from 1200 to something else because the TSP is an adopted policy for the city of McMinnville. It went through a policy process, public yeah. process for adoption. Legislative process, right? Yeah, but I mean, yes, but it, but it's oh. it was it's a it's a comprehensive community dialogue. I wasn't here when it occurred, but it's a comprehensive community dialogue that presumably went through public hearing process, went to city council and policy decisions were made. And then this development's coming in underneath those policies and saying, we're achieving your policies. So the if the discussion is we're gonna, we wanna change that policy and you can interpret your code and change the policy through this process. It'll be up to David to figure out how to write that so it's defensible as, as it gets, you know, if it gets appealed. But, um, but that policy changes, and you're establishing a new policy for the community as to what a local residential street average daily trip threshold is. Right. So, so uh, your concern, Sal, about it transitioning into that higher level street has already been established in the conditions. Yes. The, the problem but, I think I have with the policy is that it sets up a cliff, right? where you take everything to the highest level of threshold so that you don't go over the number to, to trigger the second access, mm -hmm. right? Which is what we have here. You, you know, the, the, at 109 units, we need a second access. Mm -hmm. So we only go to 108 and we don't require the second access. And that pushes the through traffic to the upper level of what a residential street will allow, right? And, and, that, and, 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 and so if you go one more, then you can't do it. But I, I, I guess... Right? And so, and, so, and so what I'm having a problem with, I think, and why it's a difficult policy to address is because of the nature of that cliff. Because you're going to move the number and it just creates a new right. kind of lower cliff. But I'm I not quite, I haven't really wrapped my head around how to address that from a policy standpoint, but maybe you've seen it in other cities and maybe there are better approaches. Well, I, 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 don't, I don't remember what the average daily trips are in other cities, but I did, just to share with you, um, this process that's taken place with this development project, because I, I, I don't want people to walk out of the room assuming that the developer proposed 108 you, lots because that was the maximum they could propose with the one access. They actually came in with their subdivision pro proposal and just like they provide testimony tonight, they were not required to do a traffic impact analysis. So they didn't provide it to us. They came in with their subdivision proposal with their number of lots. We then said to them, we think traffic's an issue because we had already heard from the neighborhood. They had the neighborhood meeting before they had the land use application submitted. We got a petition from neighbors in the in the area who were concerned about traffic. And so we said to them, we think traffic's going to be an issue in a discussion. You might want to do a traffic impact analysis. But they met all the criteria. They didn't have to do that. The 108 lots was established before that traffic TIA came forward. Um, relative, we sat down and talked about how the What's on the books right now for, for plan development for the two existing plan developments that have the booked plan into the zone, like I was describing for Councillor Garvin, the way it works for plan developments here, is 129 lots. 
It's not 108 lots, it's more. But we talked to them about, we're concerned about the floodplain, we wanna put that into public ownership. So there was a, a, lot, a lot of discussion going back and forth and we were trying to figure out how to get more lots. We had the conversation with them, can we get more lots into this? And, and you'll see that the size of the lots are smaller. So the, the zoning departures that we talk about from the existing PDA to the amended PDA is a lower average size lot, a smaller minimum size lot, things are shrinking this way. So I don't, I just don't want people to walk away assuming that they, they have booked into what, what the TIA is. Saying. Right, and, and I apologize to the Zoom Waltz. I did not mean to cast a negative aspersion on your conduct. You guys have done a really good job of putting together a, a, a reasonable proposal and I, it, it, and so I don't want that to reflect on you. Thank you for that clarification, Heather. So what happens if, um, this uh, uh, changes happen at the state level and all of a sudden um, every single one of these lots can be a quadplex. Yeah, so uh, interesting dialogue. Uh, so House Bill 2001 passed. Every single one of these lots could be a quad. Not the smaller ones, I'm pretty certain, but um, and so that's why the condition of approval is not you can't build out a quadplex, meaning four units can go on a single family lot. And that's that's the state legislation that just passed through the state. So that's why the condition of approval says um, it's units and not lots. So, you know, if all if there's fours, whatever, 108 divided by fours, that's how many lots would be developed before we hit that threshold. So they could end up with undeveloped land until the secondary access is provided because we've hit the threshold of dwelling units per average daily trips. And what's interesting about all of that is based on the different types of dwelling units, they produce different types of trips. There's a science in, in this manual of how, how they're looking at things, multifamily versus single family, that type of thing. So actually, you know, we're putting a condition on there that could be more conservative than actually than what it's built out to be if it goes into that type of process. Um, when the legislation was going through, McMinnville was at the table talking about their concerns with the legislation. And one of the things that was not in the legislation for a very long time until the very end was transportation. So we have to, as a city, allow every single family lot to be built to a quadplex. We have to figure out how to allow that and whether our infrastructure and figure out how our infrastructure can support that. But transportation was never part of the bill because they didn't want transportation to be a barrier. Uh, as planners, we came in and said, that's really difficult because in the community, they're feeling that. And if you know, we can't pretend to add four times as many units to our street system across the whole city without understanding what that does to the street system. So yeah. That was the complex discussion that happened at the state. Uh, yes. I, I just wanted to bring up something that your transportation person spoke of that in your observations, the actual traffic per household was less than anticipated, correct? It, it would, the, the record is closed, so I would okay, advise. I just wanted to bring that up because I think it kind of went over everybody's head, so to speak. But it is another mitigating factor. So we're down from 128 lots or 29 lots to 108? Yes. Plus the actual traffic probably is less than anticipated. Yeah, I mean, I've been back in that subdivision a few times and over the years of living here my whole life and I've never once got out on Baker Creek Road in five seconds. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that right there. That, that, that was not, a mis uh, that was a misunderstanding of what was stated it, in terms of the impacts. It's five additional seconds beyond the current wait time. So it's the incremental impact, not what the wait yeah, time is now. Is that correct? That's correct. That was a distinction I was gonna make. And also I was gonna remind the council that we as a community, when we adopted this transportation plan in 2010, and I may have mentioned this at the last hearing, um, we decided as a community that we aren't gonna be able to build our way out of congestion. So we as a community decided we would 
uh, tolerate more delay at intersections as we grow. And so that's gonna be a challenge for us moving forward as a community. We're, as the rest of the property we have now develops, we're gonna increase traffic. And as we talk as a community about how we might expand our current boundary, we're gonna have more traffic. And we've decided as a community that it's not affordable to build our way out of congestion. There are very few opportunities to build more east-west corridors in this community, given the geographic constraints with Cozine Creek. Um, and so we're gonna have to look at policies that larger communities have looked at as far as a robust transit system a robust pedestrian and bicycle system that encourages other route or other methods of transportation. But we have agreed um, almost a decade ago that as we grow, we're gonna have more congestion and our intersections will become more difficult to, to navigate. And that, I mean, that's the difficulty with development. It is a very emotional issue. There's no doubt that if one more house went on at the end of that street, you'd have more traffic by your house than you have today. And, and so it's zoned residential property that's uh, intended for development. And um, it, it, you know, per our current standards meets the traffic thresholds, but it certainly understand the concerns that the council's expressing and the concerns that the community is expressing. And perhaps as we move through Heather's uh, work efforts uh, regarding how we're gonna grow as a community, the recent great neighborhoods standards. Um, it's time to revisit uh, local neighborhood traffic thresholds, but um, we'll have to figure out, it, you, you're not gonna build more roads that takes away developable land. You're gonna have to figure out how we're gonna accommodate uh, transportation needs as a community. Thank you, Mike. Go ahead, David. I, I just wanna, um, address Councilor Peralta, your concern about how this seems to be handled differently than, than prior matters that have come before the council. And, and I think the, the distinction there is that this is a quasi-judicial matter, not a legislative hearing. So there, there are, the, the next step from here is a court of law. And um, the findings that by statute have to be made in order to support the decision are much more rigorous than the findings that might support a legislative decision. So when you're going through a legislative process, if we were considering the transportation system plan as a part of a legislative process and making amendments to those thresholds, it'd be a very different standard that would have to be met than making a decision on these applications and whether or not they meet the criteria that exist at the time that the applications were dropped and the findings that have to be adopted to support those. That's why I'm, I'm pushed the way I did, and I apologize if, the, if that was not clear why we were trying to establish what those thresholds needed to be, because we'll have to articulate them clearly in the findings document that would then go up to the next level of review. Um, Mike, can I ask you about um, uh, 1,200 vehicles per day on local neighborhood streets versus other cities? Um, in the report it says around the country. I don't know if that really meant around the country or around the county, but either way, um, that have used neighborhood traffic management plans that trigger mitigation efforts when the average daily traffic exceeds a thousand vehicles per day. Or I guess my question lies in: um, are, What's the difference between those two different acronyms? Vehicles per day, average daily traffic. Um, and and why um, in the development of our standards was it different than um, a common practice that's then noted in this report? I don't think I'm gonna have a good answer for you on tonight on that, Remy. I, I don't um, have enough familiarity about other communities' uh, transportation system plans. It's just not a body of work that I'm familiar with. I do know that um, when uh, the Transpo group walked the community through the transportation system plan update, we did have a very engaged uh, citizens committee that uh, walked through those discussion points. Uh, and then we had a very, uh, uh, as Heather mentioned, uh, she expected there was, and there was a very robust public outreach process and dialogue, as well as um, interaction with the planning commission and the, and the city council policymakers at the time. 
and we were bringing forward um, at least in the 2008 through 2010 timeframe, um, the best practices for complete streets for local um, uh, commu uh, residential street standards that were in place at the time. Um, uh, I believe you noted there is in the applicants um, materials a discussion about local street standards and how those vary across communities. And so it's very much, I think, a community dialogue that takes place in other communities, and that's how those thresholds are set. But um, we landed on 1,200 based on uh, the complete street standards that were um, uh, sort of being discussed community-wide and, and um, by our consultants at the time. So. Okay, thank you. Um, if I may just kind of summarize where I think we are right now, we've had some discussion about possibly wanting to take a look at the legislative piece, but I don't think we have enough time to have public hearings and doing the type of work that we need to do to change legislatively the transportation plan. Um, and so I guess I'm back. I have a motion and a second. I just want to get a sense of uh, are we still at an impasse? Do we move forward? What do you want to do as a council? Well, there's also what Remy said about wanting to extend to what, August 13th or whatever. So that's on. But that would lead, I think, to a legislative changing of criteria. And I don't think that we have the time to be able to do a justice to that with a public hearing and having input. Oh, I think. Well, if we chose a different number and we could all agree on it, so that would be a reason to extend. Okay. And I, that's the only one I can think of. Yeah, I, I wouldn't wouldn't want to suggest that that you would be changing the legislative criteria that were applicable to this because we can't. They, we can't. That's right. Um, but. If, if you believe that um, the comp plan policies can only be satisfied by looking at something other than the transportation system plan and you want to um, identify what that objective criteria is that we can then write findings around, that that's, I think, if you want to go in that direction, we just need to know. Um, if the majority of the council wants to move forward as is, we need to know that as well. So again, we have a motion and a second. We've had discussion. I just need to, do we, do, we, do we move forward with a vote? Or do you want to come up with a compromise as a group? What compromise is available? Well, fewer homes. That's the only option that we have. So unless we are stating a reason for delaying the vote, other than the fact that it's 20 minutes until midnight, we, there has to be a reason beyond that to delay the vote to August 13th? Or oh, we, we could we, delay we, the vote until August 13th to for a chance for digestibility on everything? Absolutely. I think the only thing Heather was pointing out is that it, if you do want to change the recommended findings that have been presented by staff, um, you're providing us no opportunity to thoughtfully right. develop that um, prior to the decision having to be made. So I think where I'm going to go right now is I'm just going to go down and talk. Uh, Zach, what are you, what's your feeling right now as we sit? Uh, I'd be fine voting tonight, but I also would respect to be fine hunting for the next meeting. So. Okay. Remy? No, I, I still don't like making late night decisions and we have however many more to make after this. Um, so I guess in, in, a, in a way I would prefer to move it to the next um, meeting where we could uh, have the time to digest, but I, I also understand that, um, you know, I'm, I'm requesting that without real cause other than just time to um, sit on, uh, sit with that information. And I absolutely hear what city staff is saying that if there were to be a change request to come out of that, that um, it, it's insufficient. So, you know, if, 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 the, if, the, if the desire of the council is to vote tonight, I, then um, I will. Okay. I think. Wendy? Um, I'm ready to make a decision tonight, but I also would respect extending, so I'm, I could go either way. Adam? 
So just to clarify with David and Heather, we could put a condition in there that they couldn't do a full build out of 108 lots until there's a secondary access. We just need to come up with that number or we don't have the legislation currently to put that condition in place. I'm gonna defer to David on your discretion with interpreting existing standards. However, I would encourage you to talk about units and not lots, dwelling units. Right. Thank you. Right. 108 units. Have to be based on a trip number. That would be something other than the transportation plan. If that's how we came out with 108 units, correct? Yeah. The, the current the current condition that would have to be amended right now. Um, is tied directly to the, the trip count and um, the transportation system plan. So that's what we'd be looking at having to amend. Um, so we need to get a sense of what we're amending that number to um, and, and the, the basis for picking that number over the number that's in the adopted transportation system plan. Which and then, and then us between a rock and a hard place yeah. because that's making a decision no matter what. You're either deciding on the application as it is or we're trying to make a, what seems to me to be an arbitrary decision about moving the needle in order to satisfy the concerns, which I think are not at all arbitrary. I think they're quite valid, but it, there's similarly to not allowing time for staff, it doesn't allow time for thoughtful conversation or dialogue about where that decision would need to be or, or what it would be based upon. And to your point, Remy, I feel like if, if you're uncomfortable with making late night decisions, <laughs> one, where we're setting a precedent, where we're going right. against a, a long process, a dialogue with the community, transportation plan to come up with an, a different arbitrary number. I don't feel comfortable with that. So I would not be in support of doing, going through that process, especially at this time. <laughs> so I, I wouldn't be in support of that just because I would feel like it would go against the very thoughtful process that's come before us right. to establish that number. Um, Sal? <laughs> um, I'm leaning no. Um, I'm okay with voting on it tonight. Um, I'm, I can probably get to yes. I just feel like, you know, I, I'm really uncomfortable with having that full build out without a second access point. I just, I feel like there's got to be a way to get to yes because I feel like this is going to be a good project for the city. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I like the subdivision plan, I like what you guys have put forward as far as the layout goes. I just can't get past that Pino Drive is gonna have 146% more daily trips than Cozine. I mean, you're, you're putting a ton of load on one residential street and I get that currently our code is right at that threshold, but um, that was before my time on council. I wouldn't have voted for that. Kelly? Uh, I can vote tonight. I have no problem with it. What do you want to do, Mayor? What's that? What do you want to do, Mayor? I, I'd like to take a vote tonight, personally. Uh, I, I don't see... Uh, you might be able to get our heads around it a little more, but it's more steady, but I don't see a clear-cut direction for us outside of where we sit tonight. And it's fresh in our minds. And I'll tell you, uh, you know, a week, two weeks away, things start muddying up if you don't stay steady in this stuff. So I think what I would like to do is um, I would like to recognize that we have a motion by Kelly and a second by Wendy. Um, and we've had the ordinance read a second time. And so we're back. Melissa, could we do a roll call? And just to confirm, this is just ordinance 5065. We're going to do the same thing for 5069 and yes. then the same thing for 5070. Abs absolutely. Okay. Okay. So Melissa, we, we will have a roll call on ordinance 5065. Which is P 
Councillor Jobkin? Aye. Councillor Garvin? Aye. Councillor Geary? Aye. Councillor Peralta? Aye. Councillor Stassens? Aye. Council President Minky? Aye. Thank you. The vote is unanimous, six to zero. Um, that takes us to, we are now ready to have a second reading of ordinance 5069 for the first proposed plan development amendment PDA 4-18 along with new additional conditions. Um, do I have a motion? I so move. Second. It's been moved by Kelly and seconded. Whatever amendments were necessary. Okay, uh, again, we're looking at ordinance 5069. Uh, it's been uh, moved by Kelly, seconded by Wendy. Uh, I'll have the city attorney read 5069 for a second time. This is the second reading of ordinance number 5069, an ordinance amending the Oak Ridge Meadows plan development adopted by ordinance 4822 to add property to the boundary of the existing Oak Ridge Meadows plan development overlay district, allow for lot size averaging, allow for modified setbacks, allow for some lots with side lot lines oriented other than at right angles to the street upon which the lots face, allow for some lots to exceed the recommended lot depth to width ratio, allow some block lengths to exceed the recommended maximum block length standard, allow for the designation of an approximately 0 0.85 acre active private neighborhood park and allow for dedication of an approximately 5.6 acre public open space greenway dedicated along, excuse me, dedication along Baker Creek. Thank you, David. I will have uh, Melissa do a roll call on ordinance uh, 5069. Councillor Jobkin? Aye. Councillor Garvin? Nay. No. Councillor Geary? Nay. Councillor Peralta? No. <clears throat> Councillor Stassens? Aye. Council President Minky? Aye. So are we at it's a tie vote, so the mayor gets to cast a vote. And I will say, I will, uh, yay. I'll cast <clears throat> the vote. Okay, that takes us to Ordinance number 5070 for the tentative subdivision plan S318 along with the new conditions that are uh, uh, being put on that, uh, which includes exhibition uh, uh, six, the alternative six. Um, we'll, um, okay. Oh, I, you need a motion? Yeah, I need a motion. I so move. Okay. Second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Kelly and Wendy, uh, will the city attorney read ordinance 5070? This is the second reading of ordinance number 5070, an ordinance approving a tentative subdivision for a 108 lot phase single family detached residential development at R4417013000, R4407006002. Thank you, David. Melissa, will you do a roll call? Councilor Jobkin? Aye. Councilor Garvin? Nay. Councilor Geary? Nay. Councilor Peralta? No. Councillor Stassens? Aye. Council President Minky? Aye. We have a three to, fee, uh, three, to three uh, split, and I will say aye. Thank you. For this portion, we have, uh, let's see, both of these. Yep. Uh, this is the decision of the McMinnville City Council to approve, approve yeah. application. And this is the final decision of the city of McMinnville. Uh, the decision may be appealed to the Land Use Board of Appeals by filing a notice of intent to appeal with LUBA within 21 days of the date written notice of the decision is mailed. Thank you. Uh, we still have council meeting to go through. <laughs> this may be our longest one yet. Uh, 
this takes us to an invitation for public comment this evening. Uh, anyone in the audience is invited to provide comment, I may speak on topics other than a matter in litigation, a quasi-judicial land use matter, or a matter scheduled for public hearing at some future date. Comments will be limited to three minutes per person, um, and we have a number of uh, uh, individuals that have uh, been with us this evening. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, staying. Our first one is Dan Hilbert, and I think Dan took off. Um, is it uh, Denise Chambers? I'll move on. Is it Chris Bean? Chris? Um, <clears throat> Have a seat and speak into the mic, if you would. Um, I'm not sure exactly how uh, off topic or on topic uh, this is going to be, but I, I I came by and I saw that this was going on, and uh, you know the talk of homes came into came into uh, you know topic, and it piqued my interest, you know, because it's, it's a big thing going on here in McMinnville. Uh, you know the lack, like you were saying, the lack there, the lack of homes, and then the the need for uh, something different. Um, one thing that I have uh, noticed about the, the the meeting here specifically today is that we're talking about we're talking about uh, how much people's plans are going to impose on other people's lives, you know, uh, and how, how much uh, change it's going to bring. You know, and whether whether that's okay or, or not okay to, to impose on somebody else's uh, rights, and you know, we don't have a right to come to being comfortable, but we definitely have a right to to, to be there, and protect what's ours. Um, with that being said, you know, I'm not a person that, that has any 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 real power. I'm not a person that that. Would really be affected by by any uh, by any decision made here today, at, at least in, in this uh, in this specific matter. But being a person that is directly affected by actions of the city council, actions of, of the police department specifically, um, you know, and a lot of people making decisions that you know greatly affect my life without me knowing. Um, I just kind of want to make sure that everybody involved, regardless of the fiscal advantage, you know, uh, just take time to really sit down and think about the impact they're going to be having, you know, the people that they're going to be putting out. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate your comments. That takes care of our public comment this evening. Um, we now have uh, our consent agenda, and uh, we have a number of items that are on there. Anyone that would like to have uh, request to have anything moved off our consent agenda this evening? Okay, uh, I'll take a motion. So moved. Again, a second. <clears throat> and moved by Sal and uh, seconded by Adam. All those in favor of uh, accepting our consent agenda e this evening, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please signify by saying nay. The consent agenda this evening passes six to zero favorably. Uh, this evening, we have a number of resolutions that are in front of us. Um, and I'm, I'm going to back up just for a moment, and uh, given the lateness of the hour, we will defer any of our uh, committee reports, okay? Mm -hmm. And department head reports. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, resolution number 2019-50, a resolution submitting a proposed initiative, a charter amendment to the city 
uh, of the city of McMinnville voters. And so I'll call on Melissa to present this to us. Okay, thank you, Mayor and City Council. Um, the city received a prospective petition from Art Bradley back in December for a charter amendment restricting city regulations and fees on care facilities. Um, so state law requires that 15% of the registered voters on the date that's filed um, that um, we get that many um, signatures. So that was 3,095 signatures were needed for the petition to qualify for the ballot. Uh, the city attorney then filed a ballot title in compliance with state law. The chief petitioner filed a petition for review of the ballot title with the Yamhill County Court back in March. And Circuit Court Judge Jennifer Chapman issued a letter of opinion regarding the ballot title back in March. So the, on May 17th, the chief petitioner met the requirements outlined in stat, state statute and began to circulate their petition. And then on July 3rd, they returned the signature sheets to me. On July 18th, the M <coughs> County Elections Office verified that 3,455 signatures were valid, so they had enough signatures for it to move forward. Um, so now I, um, as the city elections official, must follow, uh, file this initiated measure with the city council at this meeting. And then um, regardless of the action that you take tonight, I s will need to prepare and submit a measure Notice of measure election to the county elections official. So this will be going on the November 5th ballot. 2019, um, okay. 2019? Yeah, 2019. So um, our charter states that no charter amendment can become effective unless it's approved by a majority of the votes uh, cast by the legal voters in the city. So this means that um, council does not have the authority to adopt this measure without submitting it to um, the McMinnville voters. Thank you, Melissa. Mm -hmm. Any any questions from councilors on on this resolution? What, what's Sam? the um, result of our action? We, what, what, what are we able to do here? We've so, got, I think, three options, don't we? Go ahead. Okay, so um, you can reject this tonight. It uh, still has the same outcome as far as being on the ballot. It still has to go forward. You can also um, refer a competing measure. So that's another option. Um, and that could be on the November 5th ballot. And there would be a process to that that I included in your packet. Um, yeah. Or approve. Sorry. Said, or, or they could approve the. Yeah, they could also approve. Yeah. Approve it. So those are. But it would still have to go on the ballot. It still goes on the ballot. Goes yeah. On the ballot. Yeah. Yeah. No matter what. That was my question. Yes. Thank you. So in reality, really, what? <laughs> the only the only thing we could really do would be to refer a a, a, sep a separate measure. Would be the only thing that would have a an effect. It sounds like to me. Absolutely. Okay. So. Any other discussion? We do have some public comment on this this evening, so I've got a number of individuals. Um, uh, Fee Stubberfield, Fee, you've had to wait a long time for. Again, you could you we'll we'll take everyone's comments tonight. If okay, thank you, Fee. Um, Gwen uh, Dayton, welcome, Gwen. Binder. Welcome. Well, it's been a long evening, hasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Mayor, uh, members of the council. Um, my name is Gwen Dayton, and uh, we do appreciate the opportunity to speak with you, but I will hit the highlights given the hour, and I know you're all tired and you've had you've had a, a long evening. So um, as I said, my name is Gwen Dayton, and I'm general counsel for the Oregon Healthcare Association. And I've been a healthcare lawyer for over 25 years. 
and have spent a lot of my time working on development of health policy as expressed in administrative rule, statute. I worked for the Office of Legislative Counsel for the legislature for almost five years drafting health care laws for the state legislature. That's the perspective um, that I bring to you. Um, and We've heard that there's actually a couple of reasons um, why uh, the city adopted Ordinance 5059. One is a revenue raiser. You know, you need more money in your fire department. But we also heard that you are interested in um, uh, imposing fees, fines, taxes, in order to support the imposition of care standards on senior care facilities in your community. And that's primarily what I'd like to talk about. Um, and again, I'll just hit the high points. And I know that any of us from Oregon Healthcare Association would be glad to meet with you again, collectively or individually. So if you have questions about what I've said or feel like there, um, there's more discussion to be had, we are certainly very glad to have that. Um, the point I wanna make is that senior care facilities in McMinnville and statewide, nationwide, are heavily regulated already. DHS, uh, Dalton People with Disabilities, employs over a thousand people, specially trained, specialized people to survey, investigate, manage um, care provided in, in senior care facilities. Um, just this last legislative session, the legislature uh, invested $3.94 billion to support this. So over the next biennium. So this is a big deal, that's my point. We're also still heavily regulated on the federal level by the Center for, Center for Medicare, Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS. Uh, this is them. This is all the regulation that we currently live with and, uh, and, and support. I mean, these regulations are important for the well-being of the people we care for, so we don't oppose them. But we think it's untenable for the city or any city to try to put another layer of regulation on top of all of this. Uh, we don't think that's useful, frankly, and most importantly, for the people we care for. Because new regulations imposed uniquely in one city are going to inevitably conflict with all of these regulations, duplicate them, confuse them, so you'll create chaos on the provider level and no benefit to the care for seniors. So we are concerned with that as one of the, uh, I think, the articulated goals um, of the ordinance. And we're also, we're just frankly surprised um, at the process that was used to develop um, the ordinance. I'm, I spend my life, you're probably all pitying me when I say this, I spent a lot of my life in work groups, working on administrative rules and statutes. And these work groups are comprised of people that have an interest in the issue, and they come from different perspectives, right? So something like your ordinance should have involved conversation with not only providers, of course providers, but not just them, residents families, advocates for consumers like AERP, Alzheimer's Association, Department of Human Services, because you're regulating the same people they regulate. Where were those people? We, of course, were not notified of it, notified of the conversation and we're not participants in it either. And the problem with that, the problem with that is that you end up with words on a page that aren't vetted with people who have to work with those words on those pages and they don't necessarily end up being as productive as all of us, all of us hope. Because I think you have the same goal we do. We want good care for the people that are in our communities, absolutely. I think you genuinely do too. I don't think the words on the, ordin on the pages of the Ordinance 5059 support that. And I regret that. I think there was an opportunity to, to be more productive in that regard because we understand that you have challenges. We understand that you have budget issues. So do a lot of cities. Uh, we're not disregardful of that at all. Problem is, our communities also have budget issues. And more importantly, again, the people that live there have budget issues. They're living on fixed incomes and your ordinance is going to cause the cost of care to go up. We wish it wouldn't. We wish that was not a consequence, but it will be uh, because the ordinance imposes um, a, a quite a significant bed tax uh, that will, it's actually meaningful for our communities. Um, so this is where we found ourselves, and it's not, a, it's not a place that we, we wish we were. I wish we'd been able to work more, more um, uh, with you early on. We remain willing to work with you. We always remain willing to work with you to develop the best solutions for the people we care for. I'm glad to answer any questions. 
Um, just one question. Um, one of the reasons why I believe the ordinance was adopted is that there is a significant uh, uh, shortfall in, in, the, in the amount of money received for providing emergency care mm. to your facilities mm. relative to the Medicaid reimbursements. Yes. Um, when that money, when there is that shortfall, that money comes out of uh, the city's general fund. So the city taxpayers are paying for that uh, out of their property taxes. Sure. Um, so it seems to me that the city is subsidizing um, the business model for some of your facilities um, in, in, as an alternative to the city subsidizing those services. Um, what kinds of frameworks do you uh, think we should be considering to uh, get at cost recovery? Yeah, Council, thanks for raising that. That's a great issue. Um, we understand that. Um, <clears throat> that uh, we think that there certainly are best practices that our communities can engage in re regarding use of EMS. We don't support use of EMS inappropriately at all. And in fact, one of the things that um, OHC has done successfully is work with the city of Portland on an ordinance they recently adopted imposing a fine on senior care facilities for using EMS solely for lift assist. I, I helped work on some of the language um, and we collaborated and ended up supporting that ordinance. So we're not, a, we're not opposed to appropriate, um, I don't know, this isn't the right word, but it's midnight, cost sharing. Um, but, you know, if a facility uses EMS inappropriately, Portland has an ordinance now, Redmond has an ordinance that opposes, opposes a fine for doing that. But those fines are one, they're much more rational. The, po the fine that's imposed pursuant to the ordinance is half what we get paid for Medicaid every month. So in Portland, it starts at 200, goes to 450, and then 850, I believe. So if you have one inappropriate call, you're 200, then you have another one, you go up, and another one, you go up, right? So you get penalized if you're just, you know, haven't figured yourself out, right? In Redmond, it applies to, to everybody. Um, any inappropriate use of EMS, regardless of whether you're an individual or a, or a facility. So I'm not arguing for one of those over the other. Our, my point is that there is rational policy to be had around EMS and where OHCA is actively engaged with other cities uh, to develop that rational policy. We would be happy to work with you on that as well. Um, in, in, terms of, uh, in terms of cost recovery, um, you know, philosophically, for me, it's very important that we not be subsidizing the costs of, of emergency services um, t to for-profit or, or non-profit um, senior care facilities. Does your uh, industry association have a, a position on that? I mean, are, are you... Are, are you uh, favorable or open to the idea? We support appropriate regulation in that regard, mm -hmm. like just as we supported um, the city of Portland ordinance. We didn't okay. oppose that in the slightest. In fact, we helped them write it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, it, it seems like there's room to talk. Well, there is. And to be, and to be frank, <coughs> part of the problem is, one, the fee is so high, it's half what we get from Medicaid for the whole month, right? That's a problem. The other problem is the criteria for when something might be unnecessary is quite vague. And so our concern is that our, our folks are going to be chilled from calling EMS because they're going to be concerned that after the fact they'll be they'll be fine. Do you know offhand, and maybe the staff has this, how many times has the fee been levied since the um, ordinance was passed? Honestly, and I rely on staff for some of this. I've heard a couple of things, so don't rely on me completely. I've heard that it was applied and then it was removed. So it, would, it was an attempt to apply it, and then, it, and then I don't know if they formally appealed it or how they did that, but it was removed. It was a matter of grace, ma'am. So, so, Pardon, I'm so, sorry. So they, once. It was I applied it once, was, and then it was once, and but they regard the city regarded it as a learning opportunity. You, uh, as Mike, I'm sure the councilor Mike, I'm sure you know more of the reasons than I do. I've also heard that it hadn't been imposed, so that's probably some version of both of those. So things. something like that yeah, is true. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Could you explain to me uh, how you uh, deal with the concept that over the last ten years there have been a 400 violations of licensing or uh, care? in these facilities Council, make and how much you've been doing about that. I'm very glad to take that question on, but with permission, my colleague Linda Kirschbaum is here who I think could give you a better explanation. Is it acceptable if she comes up? Or I'm glad to, I'm glad to take it on too if you'd rather I do it. Is that Linda? Yeah, Linda Kirschbaum. Yeah, She's also signed I, I've up. I've got her. I've, 
Um, yeah, Linda, if you'd like to come. Again, with the lateness of the hour, I know you guys have come from Portland and you've <laughs> sat through quite a bit. If we can keep it to maybe about five minutes, because uh, we still have other things to do. Linda, welcome. Thank you so much, and uh, I appreciate and uh, being here, Mayor and uh, Council Members. Um, I am Linda Kirschbaum. I am Gwen's colleague at the Oregon Healthcare Association and serve as the Senior Vice President of Quality. Um, to answer the question and keep things rolling, because I actually was going to say good evening, but it is now good morning. Um, so with regard to the statistics and data that you've uh, mentioned, uh, Council member, um, the 400 uh, uh, violations that you noted over the 10 year period, what that equates to and what you break that down to in the facilities in this area is about 2.6 substantiated either rule violations or allegations of abuse. Um, no abuse is acceptable. We would not support that. However, that um, also over the last five years um, and looking at the data, that actually is a 1.2% um, or excuse me, um, number of uh, violations within those. So those numbers have actually come down over time because we are actually have increased the regulations in our assisted living and uh, uh, license settings in the state. So the oversight, the number of employees with the Department of Human Services, the protective service workers, the license complaint specialists that go in, the case managers that go into these communities on a daily basis almost, um, and the oversight is there really to protect um, the individuals that we are interested and that we work every day to protect and to support um, the members of our organization in providing quality care for. I'm not sure if that answers your question, um, but those statistics, when you really break them down, um, we're also um, required by law to report. We have to self-report. Um, if our members do not self-report, to the Department of Human Services, it's a thousand dollar fine for not self-reporting. So those numbers, although we don't want any abuse to occur, um, we are humans dealing with humans and we have a very, very extensive definition of abuse in this state. And so anything from what you would probably think of as abuse, of somebody being physically abusive with someone would fall into our definition of abuse in Oregon. But so would someone um, who has an unwitnessed fall and the staff cannot explain why that happened, they would still have to self-report that even though it could have been just an accident. But by law, they have to self-report that and it gets reported into those public records. Go ahead, Adam. So of those 400 violations that Council President Menke brought up, you're saying only 2.2 or 1.6% of those have been validated? No, I, what I'm saying no. is that averages out to 2.6 per building per year. Gotcha, thank you. Any other questions? We do have, uh, is uh, Dr. Jim Davis still here? Um, you have Doctor, we have a you testimony see. that we can submit for Dr. Davis. Huh. Okay. Yes. I, I, I just didn't know if she had her, Linda, if you had your own comments um, on top of answering I, I would just like to make a few that um, are in addition to um, Gwen's and I will keep it brief. Um, um, I am here to again comment on um, the ordinance and um, ask for your support of the of the resolution um, 2019-50. Um, I've been working with OHC for 20 years, formerly a nursing home administrator. I cared for my own 91-year-old grandmother in my facility when I ran a facility. But I've worked on many, many legislative efforts, work groups, um, and it's always been my experience in these efforts that they have been collaborative um, and that they have been problem solving. Um, 
that was not um, the experience um, that we had with um, the city of McMinnville when this ordinance was passed. However, um, we would very much value the opportunity to have that collaboration and work together. Um, there are numerous examples of um, different jurisdictions. Um, we've worked <coughs> over the last decade with the Tualatin Fire and Valley, excuse me, um, Tualatin Valley Fire and Rescue, um, educating not only our members on the appropriate utilization of EMS, but also um, educating the firefighters as well as the EMS folks on the differences between the settings within the long-term care system. And <clears throat> excuse me, um, and the different types of staffing patterns that are in each of those settings, be it a post-acute care setting or um, independent senior housing, where really um, there's no licensing, but there's a staff member at the desk. It's just like you and I renting an apartment. So vast variation across um, those different settings. Um, the goal was we were working collaboratively. We looked at the data. Um, we could often see where those um, troubled facilities might be that needed extra attention, extra education to bring those call numbers down as you um, pointed out, um, Councilman Peralta. So we've done this in, with Lake Oswego, we've done it with Clackamas um, Fire District. Um, some of the um, jurisdictions have what we call lift assist fines or fees like the city of Portland. Um, we're working with uh, Clackamas right now on a, on a similar policy. That said, we want to encourage the right behavior, the right actions um, on both parties. So, um, We've also looked at McMinnville's usage and call um, statistics. They really are in line with the national averages, even a little bit lower. And, um, you know, McMinnville really is um, kind of an outlier in assigning sort of these fees and fines and taxes, the bed tax particularly. Um, and we're not aware of that. I haven't experienced that um, anywhere else in the state um, or in the nation. So um, you've made reference to Redmond. Redmond has a similar ordinance. Um, Redmond does put a utilization fee on any citizen that overutilizes um, their EMS system. So again, it doesn't single out seniors. Um, I wanted to make one last um, comment um, to you and answer your question, um, Councilman Peralta. Um, the members here do pay property taxes um, and that uh, equates about a million dollars a year to the city of McMinnville, um, plus the residents who live in those um, uh, communities have also paid their taxes. Um, and so EMS services are what we all as citizens expect from our cities and are supposed to be provided from our cities. So with that, we would welcome any opportunities to work with you and to improve on this policy. Just for clarification, uh, the policy you worked on in Portland and other areas you mentioned, those were strictly for lift assist or they also address like prescription refills and UTI transports and they were they were specifically for lift assist. Okay. Yeah. I I'm uh, I don't know what your data shows. Um, I I've not heard of um, the action or the request for people to pick up prescriptions from EMS providers before. This is um, kind of an outlier um, in my experience. But if you are experiencing it, that's what we do. We go in and we work with people to, if, there, if there's an education that needs to be done, we, we, that's, that's what we do. And, because we don't support that either. Um, but the, unfortunately, the, the reasons why you can't call EMS in your ordinance are not just things like that, which you're right, that doesn't sound like a good use of EMS, but it's also wound care. It's change of condition. So if somebody has a stroke, that's defined in law as a change of condition. It's defined in Oregon laws as a change of condition. I'll send you the citation, Mr. Koch. So that's the way it's written. That's why we wanted to be involved early on because I think we know what you mean. 
well, you don't want EMS used for something for when, it, when it's not necessary. Don't, don't disagree in the slightest. We want to write this, though, so that people that actually need EMS services receive them. And people who don't, and then they're, they're not don't. taxing your system. Right. We and have the same goal here: deploying That's the, EMS and firefighters, um, you know, in an inappropriate way. We won't support that. We have never supported that. Holding aside the question of uh, inappropriate use, what about the issue of just Medicaid reimbursement not being adequate to cover the expense? Uh, it's certainly an issue that um, you know we would engage with you on and have discussion. Um, it's it's obviously broader than just the city of McMinnville. Yeah. Well, I, I'll just comment. I'm, I'm not in favor of your ordinance, but I would be very um, open to sitting down and talking to you about possible amendments to the ordinance that we have currently on the books and making changes to it to make it more um, consistent and palatable. But but for, uh, for me anyway, cost recovery is, is important. Uh, as is making sure that the system is not being abused. But by the same token, um, I think dialogue is a good thing. Mm -hmm. Cost recovery is not, it's not a new concept. We, we just want something that's reasonable and um, in line and care. that supports quality care. And not so much was it cost recovery, it is we had 500 incidences of non-emergency use of our system. That takes our paramedics, our fire out of, out of use for our citizens. Um, uh, and so this is a way to make sure that uh, right now, if, if any resident calls 911, we don't charge them anything. It's only if the care facility can't handle so something like a transportation for uh, prescription transportation here or there. We had 500 <coughs> last year. We've not had any that we've charged for since this ordinance. So it's really allowed us now to use EMT, our EMTs and our fire to do what they're supposed to, and that's to help emer those in emergency. The other piece is the fire protection. Um, it's being able to go in and make, we have responsibility from fire safety and and uh, those types of things, and that's that's what the bed, per bed charge is, is for us to go in and to train staff to make sure that uh, we have fire prevention, uh, fire doors are not blocked. We go in, we have we have numerous uh, examples of going in, and fire doors are are blocked so that in case of a big fire we wouldn't lose a it, substantial number of it. It is a challenge. I mean, you guys know it's a really high turnover industry, particularly at some facilities more so than others. Yes. And, and, and so we've had complaints from our fire staff that they go in and they train somebody and that person's blown out three months later or six months later or whatever and the new person comes in and they haven't been trained on the protocol. And, and so we end up yeah, the turnovers can be as much as three in a year. Total. I mean, that, that's yeah, been a turnover, And that includes general managers, too. <laughs> so so a, couple, a couple things. One is I think there's definitely an educational opportunity. Um, we would really welcome, um, and this is the quality improvement geek that I am, um, I'm always about the data, so I would want to see what the call data is, um, where it's concentrated at, what types of calls are coming in, um, so that you really, together, we can create some better solutions. Um, Do you know that some of your care facilities are using the ambulances as a means of, uh, if you have a patient that's not paying or maybe switching to Medicaid or something like that, they have them taken to the hospital for some reason and then they just won't come back? Um, respectfully, um, there are numerous regulations that protect residents um, well, and from involuntary yeah, move and so outs. that's what we provide once a year. That's what the $200 bed fee is about. Might have officials to investigate a facility to determine if the facility is safe, sanitary, and suitable. That's one phrase that's used. Another phrase that's used is... Um, it refers to the public safety requirements, and then it, there's another reference to... Uh, dangerous to public health, safety, and welfare. So it's not directed specifically to fire, um, fire compliance. 
And some of our buildings, um, that bed tax equals almost, that's $20,000. So for a, a, a one year inspection, um, is that a reasonable amount? Um, for someone to come in for a one-time inspection. You also have recovery fees in Ordinance um, 2016-11, which allows for resurvey um, charges to be assessed on a, f on a facility. Um, so that was adopted several years ago. So um, there's a number of policies that I think could be looked at um, collectively. Um, to achieve your outcomes and something that's fair and equitable to the seniors um, that are living in these communities. Well, thank you for your presentation. We'll take that under advisement um, uh, this evening. Um, I, any other questions? Okay. Uh, before us this evening, then, we have resolution 2019-50, which is a resolution submitting a proposed initiative a charter amendment to the city voters of McMinnville. Um, what do we want to do? Uh, it's going to come before voters, whatever we do tonight. I think we don't have a choice. We need to approve it. I mean, I guess we could just let it passively go through. It's, it's the message that you want to send. So what... I think we should vote on it. Okay. Um, so do I have a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved by Sal and seconded by Kelly that we approve resolution 2019-50. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those in, uh, uh, all those opposed, please say nay. 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 Uh, the uh, resolution does not pass. Uh, one to five. Okay, thank you. Uh, resolution this evening, number 20-19-51, uh, resolution authorizing the city manager to execute an intergovernment agreement of uh, number 33705 with the Oregon Department of Aviation. Mm -hmm. And Mike will call on you to present this evening. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. I'll refer you to the brief staff report that's in your packet, as well as the proposed resolution, the uh, intergovernmental agreement, and the state sponsorship agreement mm -hmm. related to this summer's uh, statewide airport pavement maintenance program project. This is a state funded project to do crack sealing and uh, pavement repair at the airport. There's a map in your packet showing the areas that will be addressed this summer. This will provide for almost $83,000 worth of pavement work at the airport at no cost to the city. The state covers 80% of the cost per the intergovernmental agreement and they use federal aviation administration funds for the 20% match. So unless there are any questions, I'd recommend you adopt the resolution as presented. Thank you, Mike. Any questions of Mike? Sounds like a, a win for us. Yeah. Um, so I'll um, ask for a motion to approve <laughs> resolution 2019-51. So moved. moved. Uh, I'll take Zach and I'll take Sal. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Uh, aye. Any opposed? That passes six to zero. Um, thank you, staff. Thanks. Uh, Don't leave, Mark. I want to get a picture of you. <laughs> of, of, uh, of, of counselors for a good, lively discussion this evening. I will adjourn the meeting. And that is 1231. It is a new record. <laughs> good night, everybody. Not one that I'm proud of. <laughs> <laughs>